I believe a championship layoff was mentioned there. Wow. Wowzers, those guys are crazy. Morning, this is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. It's Friday. It's the freaking weekend, baby. I'm about to have me some fun. Lots coming up on the show this morning. I'll give you the details on how to get in touch in a second. And I know you'll want to have your say on at least one of these stories, including how much do you reckon the top boss of your council earns? Have a guess. A bit more than that. A little bit more than that. Oh, you're way off. I will tell you how much the chief exec of Bucks County Council earns in a few minutes' time. Now, if you discovered that your school, your home or your workplace had asbestos in it, what would you do? Well, yesterday we revealed on this programme how many schools in Luton had asbestos. Today we have a look at whether you should be worried or not. And what job did you want to do when you were young? I'll be finding out why so many kids now dream of being famous and why, according to one Luton dance teacher, the industry is much tougher than they imagined. Lots of ways to get in touch, but as always, the best way is to give me a phone call. If you missed yesterday's show, boy, oh boy, did we have some incredible phone calls. 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. Now, any idea how much the leader of your local council earns? Well, the chief executive of Buckinghamshire County Council, get this, receives more than £200,000 a year. I think it's £207,000 a year. £207,000 a year. The Prime Minister gets, what, £145 million? Uh, million £145,000 a year? Well, that's according to the annual Taxpayers Alliance Rich List published today. How does that make you feel, knowing that in these times of austerity, when things and services and all kinds of things are being cut and we're being told to tighten our belts and councils are making cuts everywhere, the chief exec of Bucks County Council gets more than £200,000 a year. By the way, the chief exec and the county council that have refused to come on the show today, just to, to flag that up. Also, that was the case in Hertfordshire until recently when a new chief executive was appointed on an annual pay of only £170,000. Well, Justin Dealey has been to Hertfordshire getting your reaction. I'm disgusted. We get nothing for it. Just look around Hertfordshire. The roads, the schools, we can keep going. It's an awful lot of money and, uh, you know, I, I actually think it's appalling that there we are. Um, well, it's disgraceful, isn't it? You know, what, what we get and what they get for doing nothing. It doesn't surprise me. Does it make you feel angry? It does when I think of all the, you know, things that are being cut by the government and everything for the elderly and disabled people and that. It's, you know, it's... Uh, and uh, to pay people like that. Well, Martin Tucker is a director of Gaten B. Sanderson, an executive search and selection business for chief executives. Morning, Martin. Morning, Ian. Local authority chief exec salaries in excess of £200,000 a year. Is that justified? I can understand why that might seem an awful lot of money to probably virtually all your listeners and uh, well, to me too. Um, but I think when you think about what... Uh, a local authority actually does the size of these organizations you mentioned bucks county council there i don't have the exact figures to hand but that's an organization that probably spends over half a billion pounds a year that's an awful lot of money um and i would say you need a very good person at the top of that organization to ensure that that's spent well 60 grand less than the prime minister gets yeah it's not a fair comparison i don't think the prime minister is an elected politician um i think you probably want to compare it to the salary if he indeed takes one of the elected leader of Bucks County but you, Council, you mentioned, and also, you mentioned as well, the, Sorry, Martin, to interrupt. You mentioned responsibility and the amount that, that's being spent in Bucks County Council. The, the, the Prime Minister has greater responsibility in, in, in terms of who he represents and how much he spends. So there is a kind of comparison, isn't there? Kind of, but you are comparing paid officials, public servants, if you will, um, and elected politicians, and I just think the two are very, very different. How do local authority chief exec salaries compare with similar roles in the private sector? A lot smaller. Um, I think if you looked at uh, the FTSE 100, the FTSE 250, if you looked at other organisations with a turnover of half a billion pounds, um, well, well, those salaries wouldn't bear comparison at all. They'll be in the millions. 
people listening to this will, will be surprised because uh, county councils are making cuts everywhere. Everyone's being asked to tighten their belts a bit. And then to hear that the boss of the county council is getting over 200 grand, I think people will be shocked, won't they? I think they'll be surprised. But, but actually, when you dig into the numbers, um, and I think the Taxpayer Alliance, uh, who are publishing some figures today, will actually tell you that uh, the, the, the overall wage bill is coming down and coming down quite quickly. Um, and certainly the roles that I've worked on in the last 12 months, the organisations that we've worked with, uh, new chief executives are being appointed on significantly lower salaries than their predecessors. What qualities do these chief execs need to justify these salaries? Mm, three things, I think, Ian. Um, they need manager and leadership skills sufficient to run organisations of these size, running into hundreds of millions of pounds. I think they need political acumen as well. It's a very difficult task to work alongside elected politicians at a local level. And I think you need to be brave as well. Um, they do talk about speaking power, or speaking truth, sorry, under power. And uh, I think uh, chief executives have an obligation to, to stand up sometimes to elected politicians and, uh, and speak the truth. <laughs> So, finally, Martin, you think that these, these salaries of 170000 for, for Hearts County Council, 207000 for Bucks County Council, you, you think these are fair and justified and um, fitting in with their responsibility and their position? I think it's really difficult to make that judgment because you look at other comparison points and you know, we look at our own salaries, you look at your neighbour's salary, you look at the salary of the chief executive of the local hospital, uh, the chief fire officer, um, and the managing director of the large company who employs most of the town down the road. And they are all very, very different. It's a very subjective thing, very difficult to compare, and very difficult, I think, to make a decision and judgment on fairness. Martin Tucker, director of Gate and B. Sonson, thank you very much indeed. Well, Bucks County Council declined to put anyone up for interview to speak uh, to you this morning. Instead, they sent us this statement. They say Chris Williams has been chief executive for 13 years, has a great track record in leading a lean and efficient authority. Lean and efficient, you know, just emphasise those words, which has made major efficiency savings of £180 million for taxpayers over the last decade. His salary reflects the responsibility his role entails. He and his senior team are responsible for managing a budget bigger than many FTSE 100 companies. His duties include being the clerk to the Lord Lu uh, Lieutenant and therefore responsible for all the ceremonial functions in the county. In addition, Mr Williams is an advisor to a number of business organisations. Well, Martin put forward quite a strong defence of a £200,000 plus salary. I thought if, he, if, if that gentleman, um, Mr Williams, was to be working in the private sector, he could be earning possibly double that. What do you think? £207,000, Chief Exec of uh, Bucks County Council. £170,000, Chief Exec of Hearts County Council. Are those salaries justified? Do you think they are doing enough to warrant those big... And they are big salaries. Come on, let's be honest. Are they doing enough to warrant that? Or do you think... It's unfair that when services are being cut, buses are being cut, um, old people are, are losing care, that these men walk away with these big salaries. 200 grand for the chief exec of Bucks County Council. Simple question. Do you think it's fair? 08459 four double five five double five is the telephone number if you want to give me a call. And James is in Milton Keynes. Morning, James. Good morning. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm fine, thank you very much. 170,000 pounds for the chief exec of Hearts County Council. 207,000 pounds a year for the chief exec of Bucks County Council. Is that money well spent, James? <laughs> no. Um, what, what gets me is that it's, it's so highly paid, but every year they give you a breakdown when you get your council tax through and all the changes, and they say it's going to this, it's going to that. Not once does it say, oh, it's going to all our chief executives. And don't forget, he's got a whole team of advisors as well, and they're going to be paid a hell of a lot of money. So, you know, they'll say, oh, this is the amount to the, uh, the police for your rubbish collection and all this. But then at the end of the day, no, most of it's going to these big fat cats that want all the money. We just heard from our expert who said, well, actually, if these people were to go out and work in the private sector, they'd be earning a lot more than £200,000. So in some ways, it could be seen that it's a bargain we're getting them for this, this cheap. Yeah, but it's not like they're hard up, so that's money. You know, the reason why they're not going out to the other places is probably because they've always worked for the council finally worked their way up and got there and, they, and they've got a good job and it's cushy but it's, it's time and time again that you always see that 
there's a load of councillors that are corrupt. I know not all of them are, but a lot of them are. I had an uncle um, that worked in um, Westminster, and he was a benefits fraud agent. And time and time again, he was finding councillors that were claiming under three or four different people's names and properties that they shouldn't have had and all sorts. And they were paid loads and loads of money, but still getting caught for corruption all the time. And it's still going on today. I'm sure it is, James. Thank you very much indeed. Just, of course, to uh, clarify, we're not in any way implying that the chief execs of Hearts or Bucks County Council are involved, uh, involved in fraud in any way whatsoever. And I think James would also uh, uh, agree with that. £207,000 a year for the chief exec of Bucks County Council. The Prime Minister earns, I think, £145,000 a year. It's something like that. A couple of grand out either way. What do you think? Morning, this is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. It's a little bit miserable out this morning. It's a shame, because I've got my uh, remote-controlled car working for the first time. For a, you know what it's like when your kid goes, Dada, Dada, please, get the remote-controlled car, please. No, I can't be bothered. I've, re- I've got to spend 20 quid on batteries. I can't be bothered. Well, I did it. I went and spent 20 quid on batteries. It's up, it's running. I want to go out and play with it now. I want to go and play with it. Oh, wait, four five nine four double five five double five. Now, yesterday we heard the uh, story of Ian MacDonald from Harpenden whose wife Hazel had died from an asbestos-related cancer. He's taking legal action against Luton Borough Council after an inquest established that Hazel, who was a teacher at a school in Luton, came into contact with the dangerous fibres during her work. Well, we revealed on this programme that 59 schools of the 63 the council is responsible for still contain asbestos. Sounds worrying, doesn't it? But should you be worried? And what would you do if you discovered that it was in your workplace or the house that you were buying? Well, later on, we'll be speaking to James Grendon. He's a compliance surveyor for the Borough Council. But first, Graham O'Mahony runs an asbestos training consultancy service in Hertfordshire. Morning, Graham. Good morning, Ian. It's a very specific thing. What is an asbestos training consultancy? What exactly do you do? Well, what we do, Ian, we provide um, training to construction workers in the main um, who require to, to be aware of asbestos in buildings, workplaces and schools. And, of course, anybody who works in buildings where they may contain asbestos, then, of course, we provide them with a basic awareness of what to look out for if they come across it, if they've disturbed it, uh, what to do in the event of um, possible damage. Is it, am I right thinking it's only dangerous if you disturb it? Pretty much, yes. I mean, there's, there's asbestos everywhere, to be fair, Ian. It's, it's, in, it's in schools, as you've highlighted on your programme. It's in most workplaces, and we've even got it in our home. Um, and generally... Yeah, if it's left alone and it's sort of sealed and encapsulated, it's just managed by organisations such as local authorities and, and, and large businesses uh, until such time they want to carry out refurbishment works or carry out disturb- disturbance works on the actual pro- uh, fabric of the building, then it may have to be removed or, uh, or dealt with safely. And it can be incredibly dangerous, can't it? It, it, it can kill people. Well... Current figures are it kills about 4,500 people every year. Um, traditionally, they were workers who were um, manufacturing and installing this stuff into buildings. And uh, there is an increase, and it's set to peak around about the 2025 mark because you've got to understand most asbestos was being used around about the 1960s, 1970s, and the latency periods from exposure to actually developing such uh, diseases such as mesothelioma can take anywhere up to sort of 60 years to develop. So it's often referred to as the, the, the hidden killer or the silent killer because you won't feel any effects of it until much later um, based on the, the, the quantity of exposure. I'm going to ask you a really stupid question. I've, I've heard of asbestos. I've been talking about it for ages. I don't actually know what it does, why, why we have it in buildings. <laughs> Well, it was, it's basically a naturally occurring mineral that was taken out of the ground, but it has excellent properties such as uh, fire-resistant properties, thermal insulation, chemical resistance, and it was added to a lot of products to give it its strength and its thermal properties such as um, floor tiles to give floor tiles a bit of strength or toilet systems, uh, right down to Artex in domestic properties. It was added to textured coatings, um, which you see on your ceiling in, in, in most domestic properties. So it's, it's, got, it's got all these properties all built into one, and we don't have a substitute uh, that can do everything that asbestos used to do but obviously not cause you any harm so uh, it's very versatile there will be people listening to this who, who may be concerned to hear that asbestos could be in their kids school should we remove it from all schools 
I think the reality, Ian, to be very honest, is I don't think we've got the finances to remove it. Asbestos removal is very, very expensive. And uh, I, I get this question asked quite a lot. And my, my thoughts are on it. Is as long as the authorities are managing the asbestos, um, they've got to have a register. They've got to have a management plan in place. They have to re-inspect the products to make sure they're not deteriorating um, at, within 12 months. So, of course, as long as there's a good assessment process and a good management control in place, um, I don't think we have to remove all the asbestos. Um, I don't think we've got the money to remove it, to be fair. And I think the current climate that we're in and the state of the, the finances of this country, I think it would literally cripple this country to go out and remove all the asbestos. And the other added problem is where do we take it all? What do we do with it all uh, once we've removed it? So parents listening to this this morning who have got uh, kids in a school in Luton, hearing that, that 59 of the 63 schools the council is responsible for have asbestos in, what would your message be to them, Graham? My message would be that uh, as long as the, the school has a robust management system in place, which I'm sure they have because it's a mandatory requirement, um, is, is just to um, ask the school how they are managing asbestos and uh, make, make sure that they are managing the asbestos. There's no reason why they're not. The HSE do come down very heavily on local authorities um, who are not managing asbestos where there are potential exposures uh, or there have been exposures. So as long as, uh, as, long as the schools are doing what uh, that they should be doing, there should be no problem for the, uh, for the, for the, uh, for the, the kids or the, or the parents. Graham Amman, who runs an asbestos training consultancy service in Hertfordshire, Thank you very much. Call 08459 455 555. 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. Morning, Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. What job did you want to do when you were young? Well, I'll be finding out why so many kids now dream of being famous and why. And according to one Luton uh, dance teacher, why the industry's much tougher than they imagined. And this week, Friday, Friday's always the best day of the week for me because I get to speak to my adopted Nanny Eileen, who's wonderful. Haven't got any living grandparents. I've got Nanny Eileen now. She's mine. And she'll be reviewing this week's uh, BBC Introducing track by Daniela Brooker. 08459 oh, 455 555 is the phone number. If you want to give us a call, also if you want to chat to Nanny Eileen, you can as well. I'm sure she'll adopt you. Now, what job did you want to do when you were younger? Maybe you thought about being a teacher, a banker, a doctor. Well, now, loads of kids just want to be famous. I'm sure your kids probably do. As Britain's Got Talent and The Voice both get underway, a dance teacher from Luton is spending her own time and money teaching wannabe dancers the truth about the industry. Fame costs, and right here is where you start paying. Well, we sent our reporter, Sophie Solaria, to join Ish during one of her lessons. This is not just for anybody who just wants to have a little dance. This is about people who want to be real and professional and want to make it and be successful and not phased by the glitz and the glamour. I mean, we're not here to sort of be famous. We're here to dance. The fame comes and goes, but the dance, the artistry stays. Tell me why you are giving free lessons to people. The reason why it's free is basically because um, I'm training professional dancers to go into the industry and I need them to realise that it's not easy. It's, it's, it's a lot of hard work. Work. It's, it's a tough ride. You've got to go beyond your means here. This is, this is the kind of industry that this is. Because it's so competitive, you have to have that extra to be successful in it. And those are the people who stay on the training course. Those are the people who can only survive on the training course. The rest will just fall out because they just don't have the same commitment, they don't have the same sort of willpower, the, the physical strength or the mental strength. Do people come to you wanting to be famous well I do see and this is this is this is what's happened in the past the trainees have been with me for a while and then been and done some shows and suddenly it gets to their head it's like oh you know I'm a star now I'm amazing and I am trying to think to myself well you're not actually amazing because there's always going to be somebody else who's better than you and I've actually sat them down and just told them you know you're not a professional and you're not actually even that good they're sort of just mesmerised by the yeah. glitz and the glamour, but they, they don't obviously realise how much hard work goes into it. I mean, it's difficult. You've got to be training all the time. You know, we're having injuries all the time here and there, you know, and it's not easy. You need to go with confidence that you're a dancer. You're there to do a job. You're there to perform. You perform. And we, we hardly ever go to VIP parties, do we? We sort of do our performances and we come out. You know, we just simply do our job and then we leave. Why don't we do it? Tell me why. Why do you think why we don't go to those places? 
we're professional dancers. They say just yeah. come, don't they? Yeah. Why don't you go to the, the VIP parties, ladies? Because I think it's good to, to sometimes to stay professional and actually, you know, you're there to do a job at the end of the day. I don't want to have fun and joke and have a drink with you guys at the moment because we're not at that stage at the moment, you know, where, they, where I can call them professional dancers. They will be professional dancers hopefully one day, but at the moment they're still learning. So we need to keep focused. So if we go start hanging out to parties, we're losing focus, we're losing track, and we don't want to lose, we don't want to lose our track, do we? We want to keep yes. focused. Well, that's Sophie Solera talking to Ish, and I get told I'm not professional, I'm not very good every day by my boss. I know exactly what that grounding is like. Joining me now is Laurie McLaughlin, a careers advisor from the National Careers Service, and also Dr Emma Short, a psychology lecturer at the University of Bedfordshire. Good morning to both of you. Morning. morning. Laurie, you meet people who have hopes and aspirations all the time. What is the most popular career aspiration that young people have at the moment? At the moment, a lot of people are wanting to get into the music music industry. Um, They see it as really popular, really exciting, and obviously, you know, you can become famous if you are very good um, in the industry, but obviously there's a lot of pitfalls along the way. Do they actually come in saying, oh, I'd like to be famous, I want to be a star? Not very often. It's very rare. They do have a passion and a love for music. Obviously, they do like the glitz and the glamour that go with it, and they see a lot of that through the media, on the internet, television. But quite often, they are interested in the music and the writing as well. And do you encourage them, Laurie, or do you kind of say, well, let's be realistic, you're going to end up working in a factory somewhere? How do you handle it? Well, you're never going to crush anyone's dream. I mean, the aim is to really talk to the individual and find out what they're actually looking for. And we always advise people to really research what they want to do so that they can make an informed decision, speak to somebody, you know, who is a professional, for example, in careers advice that can really help them. And we advise people to get involved and start networking straight away so they can get involved at a local level because it's really important to know what your influences are and and know the subject that you want to go into. Know your skills so that, you know, you can understand your transferable skills. And also, as the lady was saying, it's it's hard work. So you might have the talent, but you have to have the likability factor and success um, is a long and hard road, so you do have to work very hard. And most people that have been successful have to start at the bottom. So, it, of course, it's about being realistic. I mean, we do send them onto really good websites so they can get more in-depth information about the industry to gain, them, to gain more knowledge so that they can move forward into the world of work, hopefully, if they've had a good understanding of what's required of them and what qualifications are needed. Emma, you've researched into the reasons as to why people are so desperate to become famous. What have you found? Well, we've looked more at why people want to be connected online and have followers and have a profile, which is sort of, I think, related to to being famous. It's about being visible, about being um, followed by lots and lots of people and perhaps, um, you know, venerated by them. We all want approval and we all want to be liked, don't we? Is there any harm in that? I don't think there's any um, harm in wanting to be liked, but I think there is a bit of a danger at the moment in believing that we can become famous and we are part of um, the same community as the people that we celebrate because we follow them on Twitter. We know what they do, we know what they had for dinner, we know what their favourite colour is and if their dog's gone, gone to the vet today. And it's, it's, it's a, a bit of an illusion because we feel like we know these people so we're connected, so maybe it's our right to be that famous as well. We see uh, also as well lots of these talent shows, The X Factor and Britain's Got Talent and The Voice and all of these things that seem to imply that uh, it, it is quite easy to become famous. Do they have yeah. an effect? <laughs> I, think, I think they definitely do, and it's, it's a very seductive trick, but it's, you know, it's, it's how television works, isn't it? It convinces us um, of a truth that perhaps isn't there. It's, it's why advertising works. You, know, you, you watch advertising, and you believe that the lifestyle is possible if you buy this product. And things like the X Factor are very much the same. You look at it and you think, that could be me in the queue. And it's as easy as that, and, and in me there must be the special gift as well. Because everyone feels special. Oh, do they? Oh, it's not just me then. <laughs> oh, that's, we've all, the, the thing uh, that, that confuses me, we've always had these talent shows on television, haven't we? We've always had the Marty Canes and all of these, these kind of uh, shortcuts to success. What's so different about the shows these days? 
So I think they're aimed at younger people, perhaps. I mean, often when you looked at the stuff 20, 30 years ago, it was people who'd done, who'd done the rounds. You know, even when Lenny Henry arrived, at, you know, as, as a teenager, he'd already for years done sort of, you know, the traditional working men's clubs. He'd done an apprenticeship, and like, you know, the two people who've just spoken as well, he'd trained, he'd had focus, he'd had commitment, um, and then it happened. It wasn't an, an abrupt thing that just happened overnight. And, and I think the focus is less on people like that because it's, it's, it's a bit boring. It's not a fun message, is it, to communicate to people that, yes, you can do it, perhaps, but you're really going to have to work hard for a long time. Dr Emma Short, psychology lecturer at University of Bedfordshire, and Laurie McLaughlin, careers advisor. Thank you very much indeed. When I was, uh, 25 years ago, I remember going to the careers advisor uh, and to uh, one of my teachers, who I didn't get on with very well. She lived in the same street as me. Uh, and so what do you want to do? In? I want to be an actor. <laughs> OK. Well, what you could do is you could, could become a, dr- a drama teacher... Yeah, I want to be an actor. No, 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 that, that, that will never happen. Here's some leaflets about teaching drama in schools. And I was completely... I was destroyed. I was destroyed. Hey, guess what? I ended up kind of sort of not being an actor, but kind of working in that industry. And when I had, my, I had an article written about me in The Guardian once, big, big article in The Guardian, and that teacher who said I would never be an actor sent me a letter saying, oh, it's really great to see you're doing so well. Maybe we could meet up for coffee. Never replied. Bitter and twisted. What were you told you should be, producer Laura? What was uh, the, the suggestion they gave you? The careers advice had no idea what I should do because I said, look, I like art, yeah. I like maths and I like English. So somebody that's creative and logical really puzzled them mm. and they had no idea. And they were like, have you thought about being a careers advisor? They were trying to get you to be a career... The <laughs> careers advisor wanted you to be a careers advisor. They didn't have any idea what wow. I should do because I had all of these kind of interests and nothing really came together. So they said, maybe you should advise other people about what to do. <laughs> I was told by my careers advisor uh, to become a prison officer. A prison officer. There we go. What were you told by your careers advisor you should be? And what have you now ended up doing? 08459 four double five five double five. Is anybody actually doing what they... They were suggested they should be doing. Cause we're together, weather-wise, it's such a lovely day. You just say the words and we'll beat the birds down to a Acapulco Bay. Sing it, Elizabeth! I'm trying to sing. Come on, let's hear you! <laughs> they say, come fly with me, let's fly, Spell sport. let's fly. Let's fly away. That was Elizabeth Rossini, who we'll hear from in a second. Who is... We may have, we may have heard her humming along a little bit. Who knows? 6.46. We couldn't catch this gentleman out. Adam Glynn. Uh-huh. See, I did that clever thing and turned my microphone off. Sneaky, Adam. Sneaky. Sorry. Adam Glynn, BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you, Adam. Let's join the very vocal... Elizabeth Rossini for the weather. You are so mean. I hope you were joking. <laughs> no, I wasn't. You weren't. That's we just so heard mean you. Mean. It was no. It was lovely, Elizabeth. <laughs> we heard you humming away. I believe that song has a certain resonance for you. Yes, yeah, so it was my first dance at the wedding, so I can dance to it. I can't sing. Well, it's it. wonderful to hear you enjoying it, and I hope it brought back lots of lovely memories. <laughs> yeah, kind of. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to give you the wrong weather now. No, I'm not. Don't oh, worry. dearie me. <laughs> there we go. That's the forecast. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Now, if you're at home making music in your bedroom and you think, oh, hang on, my songs are good. I'm as good as Owl City and Fireflies. <laughs> I don't know why that's made me laugh so much. Then you should send it to uh, bbc.co.uk forward slash introducing. It might get heard on the BBC Introducing Show, which is uh, BBC Three Counties Radio, Saturday nights, which is great. It might get played on Jonathan Vernon Smith's show one day in the week. Ah, that's kind of cool. But more importantly, it might get heard by this lady. Good morning, Nanny Eileen. Good morning, Ian. How are you this morning? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm sparky, I'm perky, I'm up for it. Good. Are you up for it? Oh, I am. Mwah. Yes, I am. I don't know why, but I'm a real... I do know why. It's producer Laura's last Friday. She's kind of leaving next week, but it's oh. her last Friday. No, oh. that's not the reason. I'm not up for it because you're going, producer Laura. You have been counting down the days, to be fair. I am looking forward to getting a professional producer in to... <laughs> No, let's... The honesty, where it's due. She's going off to have a baby, Nanny Eileen. Oh, How selfish. Pleasure. But the reason I'm up is because I've bought cake and sweeties in and I've got a bit of a chocolate rush. And, oh. and we are going out for lunch, Eileen, as well, and that's a novelty. Ian's paying. 
Wow, well, that is a novel. That is that is actually <laughs> uh, an offensive and libelous joke. <laughs> Uh, surely, I remember the tradition now, the Eileen, and you'll back me up on this, yes. that when the person who's leaving, they say thank you to everyone they've worked with for such a good, you know, eight months, and they went eight months, uh, <laughs> and so they pay for the meal, don't they? That's a tradition, surely. No. Huh? Oh. Who, pa- <laughs> who pays? You do. Oh. There's going to be loads of people going. <laughs> <clears throat> Would you like to, to um, wish... Producer Laura, luck on her ventures, or do you just want to tell her to naff off? Oh, bless her heart. I wish them both happiness. Oh, thanks, Nanny. And you will get to find out what I have. This is my last Friday, and I'm due in a few weeks. Oh, I'll be thinking of you. Oh, thank you. And then you could be like the baby's adopted great nanny, couldn't you? Oh, I'd love that. Oh, (laughs) Oh, that would be good. Can you knit, Nanny Eileen? Yes, I can. Well, I, I want to see your booty. Oh. No, th- can you knit a booty, I mean? Yes, of course I can. Yeah, I'm, I'm teasing, don't, <laughs> <laughs> I'm teasing, don't put yourself out, don't worry. Well, listen, Danny Island, we've yes. got you on, yes. as always, to listen to the BBC introducing track. Yes. This, this one, I, uh, well, I, I'm not going to put words into your mouth, I'm going to hear what you say. It's um, called Heartbreaker, it's by Daniela Brooker, who's from Watford. Yes. Should we have a little listen and talk about it afterwards? Yes, let's. Here we go. Well, there you go, that's the BBC introducing track of the week. If you like that, there's uh, BBC introducing Saturday Nights. Lots of different music from uh, unsigned acts from the three counties. That was uh, Heartbreaker by Daniela Brooker. She's from Watford. I could tell you what I thought about it, but my opinion is irrelevant. It's the opinion of this lady, Nanny Eileen. What what did you think? I love the beat. She's got a lovely, clear voice. Um, Underlying sadness again, but I think she's brilliant. I think I think she's very good. I know what you mean about the sadness, but I, I'm getting the optimism after the sadness. Yes. The sunshine after the rain is what I'm yeah, getting from that that's song. That's in the beat. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a it's a funky beat. It's a fun beat. Yeah, it is. And you're right. She has got a clear voice, hasn't yes. she? Yes. Addiction is very good, which is a little unusual these days. You, you don't get good diction these days. No. It's all slurring and talking like yeah. thinking like that. Mm-hmm. I could imagine Jeremy Vine playing that on radio too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's the kind of thing yep. he, he could talk about. He could say, oh, I've got a text in uh, from uh, Steve the Trucker. Steve is saying, oh, uh, Jeremy, I'm literally in tears at the moment at that story about that mum. Um, well, anyway, here's Daniela Brooker and Heartbreaker. I can imagine Jeremy Vine doing that. Yep. Well, Nelly, I, we, the, the marks out of ten, please. Oh, definitely ten. Ten out of mm, ten? Fantastic. Ten, yes. Very quickly, Nanny Eileen, what are you up to this weekend? Anything nice? Um, I'm going walking up Barton Hills with a friend today. Yep. Gentle walk, his idea of a gentle walk is of climbing up the steepest chilling bar in in uh, uh, Bedford. But, take you take know. it carefully, yes. Yeah, 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 hands and knees probably. Um, and we're collecting for Greyhound Rescue West of England in Hitchin tomorrow. Oh, tell us exactly where you're going to be and at what um, time. We're going to be in the Market Square, outside Starbucks, um, Hitchin Market, about 10 to 4, 10, 10 o'clock till 4 o'clock. Lovely. And it's for, it's for the Greyhounds I know you do a lot of good work it, for. It's Greyhound Rescue, West of England. So if you go along, if you see Nanny Eileen, and if you recognise her and go, oh, you're Nanny Eileen, I listen to you on Ian Lee, <laughs> I, I bet you'll get a few people recognising you. <laughs> I, I hope not. <laughs> I like being anonymous. <laughs> you don't, you don't, you don't uh, hunger for the fame like so oh. many of these young people. Oh no way, no, no way, no, 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 that isn't my scene. No, not no. at all. No. Uh, uh, well, Nanny, I, always, yeah. always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank Have a you. lovely weekend. Bit of Formula One this weekend oh, as well. Definitely. Oh yes. Yes. Of course. Oh yes. Looking forward to that. Have a lovely weekend, my dear. I'll speak Thank to you next you week. Thank you. Cheers. There we go, Nanny Eileen. Ten out of ten to Heartbreaker by Daniela Brooker from Watford. You can hear more uh, on BBC Introducing this Saturday from 8 o'clock with Gareth Lloyd. <laughs> Highlight of my week talking to that lady. I love her. I love Nanny Eileen. Here's the travel with Adam. I love him too. Oh, I, don't, I don't hold a candle to Nanny Eileen, though. She's brilliant. Adam Glynn, BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you very much, Adam. <laughs> Morning, this is Ian Lee. BBC Three Counties Radio. It's Friday. Everything feels better on a Friday. Even though it's miserable out there, you feel better, don't you? It's Friday. I, I'm working all weekend, if I'm completely honest, so... Mm. But still, it's Friday. Cakey, sweeties, pub lunch today. Oh, that'll do me, that'll do me. Lots coming up in the next hour of the show, including how much do you reckon the top boss of your council earns? 
Well, you may have just heard it in the bulletin there. If you missed it, I, I'll tell you in a minute. You may be surprised. I want to know if you think it's worth it. Well, I'll be talking to the council's union to see what they make of the figures. If you discovered that your school, home or workplace had asbestos in it, what would you do? Well, yesterday we revealed on this programme how many schools in Luton had asbestos. And today we ask, should you be worried? And what job did you want to do when you were young? I'll be finding out why so many kids now dream of being famous and why, according to one Luton dance teacher, the industry is much tougher than they imagined. Also asking on the back of that, what job did your careers advisor tell you to do? I was told I should be a teacher or a prison warden. (laughs) Similarities, I suppose, (laughs) in both of those things. What job did your careers advisor tell you to do and what did you end up doing? The ways to get in touch, you can give me a call 08459 455 555. You can text 81333, start your text 3CR, or you can go to the Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash BBC 3CR. BBC Three Counties Radio. OK, quick quiz. Do you know how much the leader of your local council earns? Have a think. Probably a bit more than that. A bit more than that. Well, let me tell you. The chief exec of Hearts County Council gets about £170,000 a year. Ooh. £170,000 a year. The chief executive of Buckinghamshire County Council gets £207,000 a year. Well, that's according to the annual Taxpayers Alliance Rich List, which is published today. Well, Justin Dealey has been uh, to Hertfordshire getting your reaction on those incredible salaries. I'm disgusted. <laughs> We get nothing for it. Just look around Hertfordshire. The roads, the schools, we can keep going. It's an awful lot of money and, uh, you know, I, I actually think it's appalling that there we are. Uh, well, it's disgraceful, isn't it? You know, what, what we get and what they get for doing nothing. It doesn't surprise me. Does it make you feel angry? It does when I think of all the, you know things that are being cut by the government and everything for the elderly and disabled people and that you know and uh, to pay people like that that's a reporter justin dealey speaking to the people of hertfordshire earlier on in this show i spoke to martin tucker a director of gate and b sanderson an executive search and selection business for chief executives i asked him what qualities the chief execs need to justify that pay they need managerial and leadership skills sufficient to run organisations of these size running into hundreds of millions of pounds. I think they need political acumen as well. It's a very difficult task to work alongside elected politicians at a local level. And I think you need to be brave as well. They do talk about speaking power, or speaking truth, sorry, under power. I think chief executives have an obligation to to stand up sometimes to elected politicians and, uh, and speak the truth. You think that these, these salaries of 170000 for, for Hearts County Council, 207000 for Bucks County Council, you, you think these are fair and justified and um, fitting in with their responsibility and their position? I think it's really difficult to make that judgment because you look at other comparison points and you, know, you look at our own salaries, you look at your neighbour's salary, you look at the salary of the chief executive of the local hospital, the chief fire officer and the managing director of the large company who employs most of the town down the road. And they are all very different. It's a very subjective thing, very difficult to compare, and very difficult, I think, to make a decision and judgment on fairness. Well, that was earlier on in the show. We can talk now to Penny Gray, the secretary of the Buckinghamshire branch of Unison. Morning, Penny. Good morning. So what do you think about Chris Williams, the uh, chief exec of Bucks County Council, getting a salary of £207,000 a year? Well, yes, it's a lot of money, and I think we'd all like to earn it. But for me, the real issue is the huge disparity between that salary and those of the staff, particularly the lowest paid staff. Do we know what the lowest paid staff receive? Oh, it depends. Uh, I mean, around about 12,000. But you have to think the majority of those people, particularly working in schools, um, work part-time. So, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a very difficult thing to actually assess. Those people earning £12,000 or thereabouts... They won't have the responsibility that Mr Williams has, will they? Well, if you're working in a school, you are responsible for a lot of things. And I think you have to remember that no council um, can work without um, the good staff. It, they are the staff are the backbone of a council, a local authority. When we spoke to Martin Tucker earlier on, he suggested that if Mr Williams were to work in the private sector, he could be earning twice as much as, as that. So to pay him £207,000 could be considered a bargain. 
uh, <laughs> it depends how you look at it. I think the thing is, um, well, let, let's put it this way. Our members are questioning not only the um, chief executive salary, but all the senior management, given the fact that we've suffered numerous redundancies over the years, together with outsourcing, and now using the voluntary sector and other partnerships to actually deliver services. Therefore, they feel that those salaries should be adjusted to take into account the perception that they now have reduced responsibilities. And do not forget that we are constantly using consultants to actually help um, organize, you know, where they want to actually outsource and all sorts of things. And they're taking huge amounts for actually coming up with what we, what some staff think the senior management should be able to deliver themselves. Mr Williams uh, wouldn't come on the show this morning, but we have been sent a statement from Buckinghamshire County Council. Mm-hmm. And, and they do make the point that, that Chris Williams has been the chief executive for 13 years, yeah. has a great track record in leading a lean and efficient authority, which has made major efficiency savings of 180, uh, sorry, 180 million pounds for taxpayers over the last decade. That's got to be well, a great investment then, hasn't it? £200,000 uh, yeah. a year? <laughs> it sounds like it, but at what expense to the staff and to services? Um, I, I would like to add, we now have a two-tier pay system at Bucks. Those that have taken the £750 adu- in inducement to go on to contribu- contribution-based pay um, and have gone on to new pay rates since April, they're now being paid 1% more than those left on actual bucks pay. Now, the pay award for those staff um, is a one-off payment of £250 pro rata, and obviously that is affecting school staff because school staff have not been able to participate in contribution-based pay. And it's only going to the two lowest bands of pay. For everyone else on bucks pay, that now means they're going into their fourth year of a pay freeze. Now, how do you think those staff feel who are genuinely struggling when they read that how much bucks are prepared to pay their chief exec? Well, it's happy to see their employees um, earn less than a living wage. Penny, what stories have you heard from people who are struggling with the wages um, they're earning? Well, I think we have to take into account the fact that we have food banks throughout Buckinghamshire now. I think there's three that I know of actually in Aylesbury. I know there's one in Amersham now. Um, and I don't know whether you're aware, but Unison, we have our own welfare system. We are now having calls on our welfare our welfare, to um, actually help people, you know, um, with things like getting their car through the MOT, ordinary day-to-day things. You know, people are getting into debt. They're getting into payday loans. They're coming to us for advice on that. Um, and I think actually local authorities have a responsibility for the local economy. Therefore, they have a duty to pay all their staff appropriately in order that they can participate in all aspects of local services and are not reliant on the public purse for subsidising their wages. How you know, much... The week, no, sorry. sorry to interrupt, just because we're running out of time, but how, how much do you think Mr Williams should be paid? <laughs> well, I don't know, but I think, you know... Um, it, you know, you should lead by example. And when we are struggling and they know staff are struggling, they need to look at other ways and what have you. Supposing um, he took a, a 25% pay cut, significant amount, that would bring him down to £150,000 a year or thereabouts. W- would you be happy with that? Um, I, th- I think it's down to the staff, but I think um, I think it's best to leave it to your listeners to judge but, but, whether... But what do you think? Do you think a 25% pay cut... Um, would be would make you happy? Um, I think it would make an awful lot of our members happy. Me personally, um, I, 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 I'm, I don't work, um, I'm not motivated by money. I'm motivated by seeing that everyone has a fair deal. And we have a motto, a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. So I think your listeners should judge that themselves. Penny Gray, thank you very much indeed. That's Penny Gray, the Secretary of the Buckinghamshire Branch of Unison. What do you think? Chris Williams... The chief exec of Bucks County Council earns two hundred and seven thousand pounds a year. We did ask uh, him or someone from Bucks County Council to come on the show. They declined, uh, but they sent us a, a, a statement. I've read some of it just there. I'll give you a bit more. His salary reflects the responsibility his role entails. He and his senior team are responsible for managing a budget bigger than many FTSE one hundred companies. If he's say it saved, as this statement would imply. Uh, 180 million, 180, why am I struggling with that number? 180 million pounds for taxpayers over the last decade. Then 200 grand a year. Well, that's a good investment, isn't it? If he's managing to save you that much money, 
That's got to be worth while. He's obviously doing a good job, isn't he? What do you think? Chris Williams, Chief Exec, Bucks County Council, earns £207,000 a year. Is it money well spent? How much do you think he should earn? 08459 four double five five double five. When you hear of a salary like that, which is about... Uh, it's about 60 grand more than the Prime Minister earns. How does that make you feel? Are we all just a little bit jealous of him? Is that what it boils down to? I know Penny there said she wasn't motivated by money, motivated by um, more uh, perhaps respectable things. But are we just a little bit jealous that this gentleman is getting £207,000 a year? Wouldn't we all like to earn that? Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five. Someone who earns close to that, I've been led to believe, Mr. Adam Glynn. I'd be happy if I earned two hundred thousand pence. Adam Glynn, BBC Three Counties Radio. Adam, we're, we're talking about um, people wanting to become famous, and, and that's led us on to discuss what careers advisors advise us to do. My careers advisor said either become a primary school teacher or a prison officer. Wow. Well, yeah, I know. They're, they're kind of similar, really. What did your careers advisor say? Uh, I was advised to be either a teacher or a journalist. They always point you in the direction of teaching, don't they? I know, it seems to be a thing, doesn't it? It is a thing. And, and what do you want to be when you grow up? Uh, I don't know. I quite like doing this. This is fine. There we go, man happy with his job. Fantastic. Adam, thank you very much. Now, yesterday we heard the story of Ian MacDonald from Harpenden, whose wife Hazel had died from an asbestos-related cancer. He's taking legal action against Luton Borough Council after an inquest established that Hazel, who was a teacher at a school in Luton, came into contact with the dangerous fibres during her work. Well, we revealed on this programme that 59 of the 63 schools the council is responsible for still contain asbestos. Worried? Should you be? Well, in March, the government's education committee met to discuss issues relating to asbestos in English schools. James Petto is Professor of Epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He gave e- evidence. James, I- is there a problem with asbestos in school? Oh, sorry. Um... Oh, I do apologise, James. You're, I, listen, I'm jumping ahead. Julian's on, Julian, you're over there. I apologise. <laughs> I do apologise. Julian, is there evidence uh, uh, with a, uh, of a problem with asbestos in schools? Well, I, it, it, I think the level in schools was quite high in the 1960s and 70s when a lot of asbestos was being used. But um, it's, it, it, it's likely to be very much lower now. The difficulty with mesothelioma is that you get cancer 60 years after you're exposed, or, or longer even. And so, I mean, if you're exposed to asbestos at school in 1970, say... I mean, the mesothelioma that, that cause is going to be sort of just beginning to happen, well, not now, actually, but I mean, in 10, 20, 30 years' time, they'll, they'll, they'll start happening. I mean, it'll be happening in 2020 and 2030 and 2040. And so there are two separate questions. There's whether asbestos in schools 50 years ago is causing mesotheliomas that we're getting now, and whether asbestos in schools now is going to be causing mesothelioma in 50 years' time. So potent- the answer to the first one is, is, is yes. I mean, there, there, I mean there, um, there's a very you know, there's a high mesothelioma rate in Britain. And asbestos in schools was one component of, 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 of what people were exposed to in the, in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Well, Julian, what, what should we be doing? Should we be removing all of the asbestos from schools? We spoke to an expert earlier on who said it would just be too expensive to do that. Well, that's actually my opinion. I mean, it's not that the risk is, it's not that there's no risk at all, but the risk is, 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 is likely to be so low now that... that um, uh, well, I mean, apart from anything else, when the, when the level is as low as that, if you whip it out, you could actually make, make things worse. I mean, it's not it's not terrible, but I mean, you you, you could put a, a tiny level up rather than down simply by uh, disturbing it. I mean, the process of removing it produces you know some asbestos, and we're talking about very very low levels. And so, uh, I think for the for the time being, it's better just to you know. I mean, obviously, if it's damaged, you manage it. But I mean, the, the risk really isn't large. The risk isn't large, but we are hearing stories of people that are dying or being affected because of their exposure to asbestos in the last 30 years or so. So there is a risk, isn't there? Oh, certainly, yes. But, I mean, it's, but, but it's, it, it, it's, it could be substantial. I mean, in, in the generation who are now... Well, I mean, I was born in 1945, so, I mean, you know, for, for my generation, it could be sub- substantial. We've got highest reason to feel which anyone ever has had or ever will have. But, I mean, for people who are now at school, um, the risk is, is, is very, very much less. How many people a, a year die from this? Do we know? Well, about 400 women and 2,000 men. It is a significant 
figure, isn't it? Th- th- and there will be people listening to this who are concerned that they possibly work in a building that does have asbestos. Well, it... it, it... As I say, it's not whether you would now work in a building that contains mm. asbestos, it's whether you did 50 years ago. I mean, uh, the, 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 there's a huge lag between being exposed. I mean, I mean, children exposed don't get the cancer as children. If you're exposed at the age of five and it causes asbestos, it'll cause it when you're 60 or 70 or 80. That's the way it works. I mean, it's, it's, you're always 50 years behind, the, <laughs> you know. 59 of the 63 uh, schools in Luton that the council, uh, council are responsible for have asbestos in them. Should the parents be worried, Julian? Well, my personal view is no. I mean, it's not whether they contain asbestos. It's, 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 it's how much, you know, how much the, it, it is in the air the kids breathe in. It's like smoking. If you smoke 40 years there, it'll kill you. But if you walk past somebody who smokes, <laughs> it won't. I mean, the, 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 it's the dose that, that, that determines how dangerous radiation is. We're all bombarded by radiation, but you wouldn't like to live with Chernobyl, you know. Uh, and do we know what the government's... Uh, I, I know the government are changing the rules on uh, how you can um, apply for compensation if you've been affected, but are they keen to leave things physically as they are? Well, the government don't know what to do. I mean, the, 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 the House of Commons, you know, the, the Education Committee, has been, been considering it, because on the one hand, there are people who... who um, Say, I mean, quite widely, that asbestos in schools has, you know, I mean, past exposure is responsible for some of the mesotheliomas that are happening now. And, I mean, particularly if people have lost their, you know, their, I mean, family members in a situation where they suspect it might have been asbestos in schools that caused it, obviously they're campaigning for something to be done about it. But on the other hand, I mean, if, 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 if the number of, I mean, if the number of uh, mesotheliomas that there are going to be in 50 years' time as a result of asbestos in schools now is sort of 5 or 10 or 20 a year, and it could be in that sort of re- region, um, it, I mean, you're getting down towards the, you know, just a, a, a risk which, which is so small on an individual level. I mean, I mean, any death is a tragedy, but I mean, if, 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 when, you, when you talk about, and at the moment we've got 2,400 mesothelioma deaths a year, and if in 50 years' time that had gone down to 20 or 40, you know, 100 times less, basically, I mean, it, w- would that be, I mean, how much money is it worth spending to prevent that? And, well, and, sure and, you... and, would, and, and would the measures work, most, most important of all, as I say? I mean, if you start ripping asbestos out, which has been sitting there for 50 years, you might well do more harm than good. The gentleman so we spoke to... Decision. It is difficult. The gentleman we spoke to yesterday, Ian MacDonald, who, who lost his wife, Hazel, through this, this cancer, I would imagine, would say that, that no cost is too much. Well, that, 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 that just isn't true, is it? I mean... If it's his wife, though, Julian, you, you, yes, you could understand that, can't you? Of course you would understand that, but... <clears throat> but, I mean... <laughs> I mean, I mean that, that, that isn't the way public health works. I mean, you can't you can't spend sort of twenty million pounds to, to say to, to prevent one death in fifty years' time at the age of seventy-five. But Julian, we we have to uh, end it there. Thank you. That was Julian Petter, professor of epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. James Grendon, I apologise for getting your name wrong, and the, the look of panic on your face when I introduced you as that <laughs> told me that I had got it wrong. You're a compliance surveyor for Luton uh, Borough Council. Fifty-nine of the sixty-three schools, the council is responsible for contain asbestos should people be worried they shouldn't no as julian as professor pito alluded to there the the problem with asbestos is basically when the material is damaged mm. those fibers are released into the air and it's those free fibers that cause the potential ill health problems so the whole push of main legislation in the uk is to manage asbestos and ensure it's in good condition and luton borough council comply with those regulations we have a very robust management policy we ensure that all the specialist materials in our buildings are surveyed, are recorded, are then input onto logbooks that are present within all of our buildings, and that information is then available for all the building users and all contractors who visit our buildings to access to ensure that those materials are not disturbed. Why is there asbestos in schools? What, what, what does it do? Basically, asbestos materials have been used for about 100 years. Um, the, the materials themselves have a number of properties which made them very useful in buildings. Um, 
that's fire resistance, it adds strength to other building materials, and back when it was originally used, before those ill health effects became known, it was thought of effectively as a wonder material, and mm. it was added into thousands of different building products, which is why it's pretty much persistent throughout UK building stock, be it schools, public buildings, commercial buildings, and indeed people's homes. There, there might be some people listening who are thinking, uh, if there's even the smallest chance of risk, the smallest chance of a teacher or, or a kid um, contracting uh, some form of cancer because of asbestos, then surely we should be doing everything we can to protect them. Well, as I said, the, the main push of UK legislation is to identify and manage those asbestos materials. It's, it's just almost impractical to actually remove them. In some cases, the way buildings have been constructed, the asbestos is used as part of the construction. You would have to demolish the building and effectively build a new one there, there is just no practical way to remove every asbestos material. So it is really the, the best practical way without you know, rebuilding 75% of the buildings in the UK is to, to manage that asbestos in situ. Is asbestos still used in building now? No. All asbestos materials have been banned from importation and use in the UK since about the year 2000. So anything built after the year 2000 should be asbestos free and so just just to clarify uh, because you uh, listen i'm a dad and i'm constantly panicking about everything uh the parents of kids who go to these schools in luton they can have a cup of tea they can relax don't worry we can assure them that we have a robust asbestos management strategy here in luton borough council we manage the asbestos within all of our buildings it is regularly inspected and regularly monitored anything that is picked up as being in a degraded condition we immediately put processes in place to remove that material in a controlled manner. James Grendon, thank you very much for coming in. Apologies again for getting your name wrong. This is Friday. I've kind of, I'm in weekend mode already. I've given up on this. No thank problem. you very much for coming in. It's James Grendon. There's a compliance surveyor for Luton Borough Council. 08459 455 555 is the phone number if you want to comment on that or any of the stories we're talking about this morning. You can also go to facebook.com forward slash BBC 3CR. Across beds, hearts and bucks, this is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio. Now, what job did your careers advisor suggest that you should do? Well, I'll be finding out how uh, so many young people now dream of being famous. I was told I should become either a primary school teacher or a prison warden. Yeah, nice one. And also, you may remember uh, last October, we told you about an initiative in Milton Keynes called Men in Sheds. No, it's not mucky. It offers the chance for men to do woodwork, model making and crafts surrounded by other people rather than on their own at the end of their garden. Well, the scheme has proved so successful, it's expanding. We'll tell you more about that in around 15 minutes. Now, what job did you want to do when you were younger? Maybe you wanted to be a teacher, a banker. Does anybody grow up actually wanting to be a banker? I can't imagine that. But now loads of young people just want to be celebrities. As Britain's Got Talent and The Voice both get underway, a dance teacher from Luton told this programme that she's spending her own time and money teaching wannabe dancers the truth about the industry. She says it's not easy and only a few can survive her training course. The reason why it's free is basically because um, I'm training professional dancers to go into the industry and I need them to realise that it's not easy it's, it's, it's a lot of hard work it's, it's a tough ride you've got to go beyond your means here this is this is the kind of industry that this is because it's so competitive you have to have that extra to be successful in it and those are the people who stay on the training course those are the people who can only survive on the training course the rest will just fall out because they just don't have the same commitment they don't have the same sort of willpower the, the physical strength or the mental strength Michelle Heaton, uh, who I've had a row with on live TV, became part of the band Liberty X after appearing in reality television show Pop Stars. She told BBC Three Counties that she blames these shows for the reason kids seek stardom. Even though I love shows like TOWIE, it's because of things like that that people just want to be famous. It's the fame for being famous. It's a crazy concept and um, people think that it's an easy road into it. But those type of people don't last. It's very short-lived. And that's the right way of looking at them for themselves, but it's the wrong way of looking for it for, for, for young people who just want to be famous because they see their idol doing it and they think that it's going to last forever and it's certainly not. And when it's over, it's all over and there's nowhere else to turn. You have to get yourself prepared. 
You have to stop. You have to stop talking about your pollen explosion now. We're on the radio. We'll discuss the pollen explosion in, in a second. I'm joined in the studio now by uh, budding performer Michael Hutchinson, uh, an X Factor backing singer Gershon Brown, both from Milton Keynes. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Good morning. Now, Gershon, you you are sniffing like a good un. Yes. You, you you were talking about the pollen explosion, weren't you? Yeah, it's absolutely uh, distressing my my vocal cords at the moment, and I've got a list of work on, and I'm trying to keep it under control. Um, unfortunately, I'm one of these hay fever sufferers that. Yep. Has to go for the old injection every year. It does work. But Sorry, there's, there's an injection for hay fever. Yeah, it doesn't work. It's, I, I reckon it's a, <laughs> <laughs> it's a placebo. But uh, in my mind, I think that it keeps it under control. But uh, this year, I've missed out, and um, I'm really suffering. So, so. Gersha, how do you you are involved with uh, talent TV shows? Yeah. How did you get involved, and what do you do? Uh, well, basically, um, I started out singing with uh, a choir by the name of Kingdom Choir, and uh, we we got involved with a lot of TV work, like the Elton John show and blah blah blah, and uh, we, we just got, throw that in there. The Elton yeah, John yeah, show. I'll throw that in there. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, we we got asked to uh, to help out on the uh, the uh, X Factor show when it first started, and it since grew from then. And I've then called back. Um, I got to know uh, Ros Coles, the uh, music uh, 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 director, and she just called on us every sort of show that came up and what's the atmosphere like there very tense yeah, very bet. tense it's it's uh, i must say it is a bit of an illusion to people that don't know what actually goes on i, f- I do feel sorry for uh the young up and coming budding stars that want to take part on the show but it is what it is it's a machine mm. and it churns out people into the industry um uh, it's a bit sad to see people that go in there sort of smiling, happy, excited, you know, you know, like a kid at Christmas trying to open his toys, and then suddenly by week two, that, that smile turns to a grimace when they realise the full force of the... Uh, but that's why people like shows like that, isn't it? They want to see the ups and the downs. They want to see, they want to see people yeah, crying. They do, but... Um, they don't envision themselves crying every single day when they're there. <laughs> but, <laughs> when you speak to the, the, and I say the kids because I'm, I'm 40 next month, so I can call these young people kids. When you, <laughs> when you speak to them, do they, do they say, I want to be famous? Yeah. Or are they saying, I, I really want to be an artist and I want to create and I want to make something lasting? W- w- what are they going for? Well, usually <laughs> what they tend to say is that they want to be like Britney Spears or, uh, uh, I don't know, Demi Lovato or the next up and Rita or uh, whoever it is. The Backstreet there. Boys, yeah. Jason well, Donovan, any of the big stars well, of the I day. I don't remember those names funny enough. <laughs> Showing their age now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, um, and, and, you know, you have to try and break it to them that, look, it's, it, you know... It, it, Really, it's 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 a magic moment to get into that doorway at that specific time, and you've got to be immensely talent talented as well. Some cases maybe not. Some cases the industry are pushing you, and they've uh, sort of designed packaged the uh, mm. individual for. How old are you? If you don't mind me asking, roughly, give me a rough. Forty six. <laughs> <laughs> Brief pause. Shut <laughs> up. <laughs> yes, I was gonna. I was gonna. I, I s- thought you were gonna say younger, with you? <laughs> no, I was gonna say like I was gonna say sort of twenty nine, thirty. You're forty six years old. Yes, I am. right. We're gonna get a picture of this, bloke. We're gonna put this on Facebook. <laughs> it's those hay fever injections. Yes, it that? is. <laughs> oh, but, well, what else that's is in what there? It is. It's probably a, a plethora of medication, <laughs> sort of uh, stave oh, off the aging yeah. process. Well, well, Granddad, pretending you don't know the uh, Backstreet Boys. There, <laughs> 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 you, you must remember. Maybe you don't. I, I remember what it was like being fifty being 20 and yeah. people saying well just be realistic you know this g- g-. yeah you don't listen at that age do you no no you don't but however back then in my day they <laughs> hate saying that but in my day it was more about the education um things like singing that was a hobby whatever happened from that was a bonus but it was all about the education you need to have a base mm. plan you know, because um, you can't put your eggs into one basket. And especially in the pop industry, shelf life is about three to four years, you know, before the next new thing is on the scene. You really need to have an education. I'm and still I- smiling because you said you were 46. <laughs> we, we're going to get a picture of you. Uh, Michael, you, you, you're 20. Mm-hmm. You're literally half my age and well over half <laughs> you. Nice, you've nice. experienced <laughs> shows like Britain's Got Talent and things like that, haven't you? Yeah. What, what kind of shows have you been involved in? Um, well, I've auditioned twice for Britain's Got Talent. Um, How far did you get? The the first time I did it, uh, it was in 2009, I think. So it was a series with Diversity, Susan Boyle. Um, I got to the judges round. Um, so there's kind of like two rounds sort of 
to get to that stage. You've got the initial sort of one where they do it about October, where they you just audition in front of producers and things like that, and then you go through to the judges round if you're lucky enough to get through to that point and that's when the buzz is with the TV uh, and the interviews with them to deck and all that type of stuff it's really exciting uh, and I also auditioned this year um, and I only made it sort of just to that first round so um, unfortunately I didn't get through to that other one but um, what's your act what do you do so it's it's generally quite hard to explain it's it's more something that you you kind of have to watch uh, and appreciate it's um it's a comedy interpretive mime that i do uh, to sort of a medley of of different songs um now whenever i say that people generally think oh he dresses up in white face paint and yeah. is stuck in a box and all that type of stuff no i don't do any of that um can you do stuck in a box uh not not but, well i mean i could possibly if i wanted to <laughs> <laughs> ian's now doing it yeah. in the studio looks good thanks <laughs> um <laughs> But it's it's like uh, if you've ever heard of a comedian called David Armand uh, mm. who did it to Torn um, at the Secret Policeman's Ball. Uh, I sort of watched him and I thought, oh, that, that looks like something I you know I can probably do. So I started doing a few of my own songs, sort of when I was fourteen, fifteen, um, and it, it just translates nicely to an act that you can do at a variety show. And so I've done it at university a couple of times uh, in a variety show and sketch show and things like that. And it always goes down really well with uh, an audience because it, it's something different. It's something that they're not expecting because there's always the singers, the dancers, the comedians comedians uh things like that um but this is something sort of something else what do you want what's your dream my dream is to become an actor basically uh, a performer um it's not so much about i want to be famous as we're sort of discussing i think that that's a little bit of a, an immature way of looking at it um but it's it's more the the passion and the buzz that i get from performing and what that's what i want to do sort of as a job for my career to mm. sort of be able to do what you love um, and when you mention that to your parents and your career advisors and, and, and teachers and things like that, what do they say to you? Well, um, it's basically like uh, what um, the guest was saying earlier, um, it's about getting your education sorted as well. So I have actually gone to university and I've just done three years of games computing, um, so like a programming degree. Oh, okay, so not, not just playing FIFA or no, something No, like yeah, that. okay, so right. that's also what a lot of people yes, say. Yeah. Oh, he plays games all day. But uh, no, unfortunately not. We, we make games or we try and make games, programming, things like that, um, with the idea of coming out of university uh, and getting a job in a games developing company to try and support me while I become an actor because it's very hard to get into. Um, so that's what I've, I've been trying trying to do um and sort of now i'm coming to the end of my degree i can then hopefully try and become an actor uh, Listen, what, would you, what would you say to him well um <laughs> interestingly enough I, I also took part in the uh, x factor as well as um uh doing the bvs on the show i entered as a contestant in 2005 um i got as far as sharon's uh boot camp group in the last 25 oh. yeah <laughs> and unfortunately for, for me the only the only scene that television seems to show was my head dipping i got ripped by my friends <laughs> you know <laughs> for months um and then the following year i i decided you know what i got this far i'm gonna go back and do it again and uh, that's brave to go back after being rejected well they told me to come back right okay <laughs> you know <laughs> i had no intentions right but because you know they said you know come back you know <laughs> then it's like well are you going to give me a chance? And funny enough, myself and my, my dear friend of mine, uh, Bev uh, Trotman, who also went on on the second uh, season, she she got through to the live uh, wow. um, uh, rounds. Um, I got f- made it through from Wembley, got all the way through all these auditions and stuff. And then uh, on my final audition, before I got to see the judges, the judges were too exhausted to... Uh, see anyone else for that day so they said <laughs> they're too exhausted to sit there and watch a fella sing yeah it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long process yeah, but, I yeah but um so basically they said look can you come back to manchester um on friday which i hadn't arranged with my company and yeah. whatever so i couldn't and so respectfully i had to decline you know sort of kick myself but i thought well look i've done enough mm. I, d- I don't need to prove myself any more than that and uh, you know and people were calling me anyway so you know I'd, but what i'd say to you is especially you touched on the acting i've also been sort of fingers in dabbling acting, in a bit yeah, 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 i've can, done, yeah. done a few sort of <laughs> walk-on parts and a few you know i did uh, oh gosh can i name drop yeah of course you can okay i did uh, perry's bounty with cillian murphy and Gl- brendan glisson played a tough <gasps> guy yeah um nice. recently bob hoskins damien lewis um will uh just been working on muppets 2 hopefully i'll be 
starting up the Captain America 2 as well. So I'm going to have a bit of a chat with you after this then. Swap. Yeah. Yeah. You, you guys need to swap numbers. I'm yeah. going to have a chat with you as just well. The, well <laughs> basically, the way I did that was I just got involved with a load of different acting agencies, just yeah. threw my name out there, put up profiles, and then the phone started ringing, and they do call a lot. Yeah. I mean, usually it doesn't sort of work in with my 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 you know day of, job yeah day job but um how hard was it to get in with all these different agents and things wasn't hard at all yeah very easy okay. it, we're, we're, we're running out of time you two need to have a chat <laughs> uh, have you got uh, gershom have you got a website people have a yes i do it's uh, www.gershombrown.com and you can also hit me up on uh, twitter i've got two accounts <laughs> oh, <goodness laughs> yeah it's so. at gershombrown.com or at brown pages pages spelled p-a-g-e-z michael you, have you got a, a website or anything if people want to come uh, and I, look? I don't have like a proper website yet um but i, I do have twitter so follow me on uh, yeah. at mike the actor man okay listen you two go off go and have a chat yeah. saw your voice out you're supposed to be singing don't I give know, me this oh I i've know. got hay fever oh i've not had my injection <laughs> <laughs> go, go and have a chat we'll speak to you later on thank you very much indeed those chaps were delightful honestly we're going to put a picture up on facebook of of, of both of them Gosh, it was for Producer Laura, were you as, were you as shocked as me? 46 years old. I didn't know what to say. If you could have heard me, you would have heard nothing because I just sat there open-mouthed and almost went, what? I'd have given him 32 tops. I yeah. thought he was definitely younger than me. 46. He's 46. You know what, we should have just scrapped the, the planned <laughs> interview and just discussed with him how he manages to look so young. But we'll definitely put the picture up on Facebook he, because I was astounded. He's supposed to be singing at the end of the show. He's giving me all this, oh, I can't, oh, I can't sing. I've got hay. Make him sing. Okay. Oh, I've got hay fever. Oh, I'm all bunged. Oh, oh, oh. Make him sing. He talks the talk. He needs to prove himself. <laughs> make, exactly. Make that man sing is what I say. We're talking about um, uh, lots of things this morning. One of the things, careers advice. After speaking to those gentlemen about, uh, you know, wanting to become famous, wanting to work in show business. What did your careers advisor say to you? Well, Rebecca has texted in, Ian, I understand your comments about careers advice in the past, but careers advisors these days are highly qualified with the main objective being to give impartial advice and guidance. We are a dying breed due to local government uh, cuts, and I've seen some excellent advisors being made redundant. Well, thank you very much uh, for that, Rebecca. Now, it's a story that we spoke about last October. A project in Milton Keynes which aims to prevent more elderly men from becoming lonely. Men in Sheds offers men the chance to do woodwork, model making, crafts, surrounded by other people rather than on their own. Well, it's been such a huge success that the group have now been asked to work with men from Aylesbury, Buckingham, Bedford and Hemel Hempstead. We sent our reporter Sophie Solaria down to the Milton Keynes Shed to find out exactly what these men get up to. Hi, Gary. Hi. We've arrived here at Unit 30. I presumed I was coming to the back of someone's house. Right, right, no, this right. is a huge industrial unit yes. full of men essentially playing with toys. Yes. Playing with railways. We've got some gentlemen at the back there chopping wood. This is hugely popular. This is the biggest shed in England, we think. Well, we know. Basically, anyone that comes here, can, if we can accommodate, we'll let them do what they want to do. There's a guy doing pottery. Uh, there's a guy, guy building a, a battery-driven car. There's an aeroplane upstairs, full size. It's just endless what we can do, and it's really good for our morale. A lot of people that get to our age pack up work and we go to seed, whereas this gives us a lease of life, new lease of life. This is a um, pottery area. You're, you're obviously deep in the zone making your pottery. Is that yeah. a jug? It is, yeah. Yeah, it won't work, but it is a joke. It's beautiful. And then through here, we've got another part. Our work area. We have in here, we have a, a welding area. This guy's renovating a 1963 wheeler bond car, it was called. That's been built from nothing. And I guess for men, it's quite a good place to socialise, because unlike mm-hmm. women, women talk to anybody, yes, don't that's they? that's right, yeah. We, we tend to make a lot of friends by doing this. Not only here, but we've made friends in Aylesbury, Bedford, Oney, even Camden Town. Hello, I'm Sophie. My name's Nigel Patterson. I'm Secretary of Menu Sheds. I've been with them since uh, day one, last March of last year. Sort of got involved in getting the thing going. We had very small beginnings, very, very small beginnings, and uh, we've finally ended up in this rather cavernous shed. It's oh. massive. 
massive and actually I understand why because every single section is being taken up. Do you yes. have room for more members? Yes, certainly. There are other, so many diverse interests going on here. It was the shed of their dreams, if you like. The shed of their dreams. Yeah. Gentlemen, sorry for disturbing your morning. I see that you're having a coffee and watching a miniature railway train going round and round on your track. Can you yes. tell me a bit about what you're, what you're doing today? Robert here is a, a railway man and he's got who's loads of experience on not only model railways but actually British Rail itself. So he's got the history knowledge. And you've decided to come here to the Men in Sheds workshop uh, in Milton Keynes because your wife won't let you have this model railway in your home, is that correct? Uh, not quite. This is uh, getting on the large side for putting it big. at home, but also that we can get together with our different skills and meet people that are, are different from the, the ones that we meet on our own clubs, as it were. You come when you feel like it, and you don't have to do anything. You can just have a coffee and a chat with the other chaps. As far as I was concerned, I moved to Milton Keynes um, about three years ago um, after I retired and didn't know anybody. So when this facility became available, it was a great way to get to know other people and to get interested in other things. Well, that's your BBC Three Counties reporter, Sophie Soleri, at the Men in Sheds. Uh, in Milton Keynes and it's been so successful it's opening up in more places and and probably extending its hours as well. We've been talking uh, about um, the council executives and how much they earn the chief exec of Hearts County Council earns 170 grand a year, it's not bad the chief exec of uh, Bucks County Council gets £207,000 a year well Sue has uh, emailed in um, these union chiefs, we spoke to a union chief from uh, Bucks County Council, have a cheek to complain about council chiefs' pay. They're on a great paycheck of around £130,000 each themselves. I did make the mistake of not asking the lady we were speaking to what she was earning. Is there any way, can, can we try and find out what, what, what kind of salary she's on? I, I, I should have put that to her, and apologies for not doing that. Surely if it's about fair pay for a fair day's work, they too need to be accountable. My own union chief had a great pay rise when she was unable to get any pay rise for her workers for the last few years. Surely not a fair day's work then. And apologies for not asking that um, lady what she was earning. We'll see if we can find out. And John has got in touch. I've worked in the local government and have a vast experience in the private sector. All the threat and talks that chief executive of local government may leave for another well-paid job in the private sector is utter nonsense. Most public sector employees would struggle to get an interview in the private, se- private sector, uh, let alone uh, a job. Local government job is so comfortable that most employees fret at the thought of going into private sector. Most local government chief executive and their employees move to another local government and not to the private sector. The re- is a, we're talking about words you can't say. The re- <laughs> Say it for me. Remuneration. Thank you very much. Is unjustified in this austere time. Thank you, John. Please don't put words in that I can't say. It's not fair. Stop trying to trick me up and, and make me stumble. Naughty, naughty listeners. Well, what do you think? £207,000 a year. Chief Exec of Bucks County Council. Is that fair? Is that justified? Our first guest said, well, actually, for the work they do, it's not bad at all. It's a bit of a bargain. And if this gentleman, Mr Williams, has saved over £180 million of your money in the last ten years, well, that's got to be worthwhile. Hasn't it? Hasn't it? 08459 four double five five double five. And we're talking about um, careers. This leads on from our subjects about young people wanting to be famous. I want to be famous. I want to be famous, a star of the screen. What, what's that, what song is that from? Oh, Drive My Car by the Beatles. Yes, thank you. Um, we've been asking, what did your careers advisor say to you? Mine said I should become either a prime... No, well, my teacher said I should become a primary school teacher. The careers advisor and inputted my data into a computer in 1986, so it's going to be a BBC micro. It came back saying I should be a prison officer. Yenda in Sundon says, I can't remember the school careers telling me any career, but I do remember my sixth form teacher telling me that any application I make to Polytechnic just wouldn't be worth the postage stamp. Oh, dear. At 24, I did go to u- uni and later became a vicar, so the stamp was worth it in the end. Well, 08459 four double five five double five Facebook.com forward slash BBC 3CR. Right, here's the travel news now with Adam Glynn. Just got to say, at my school, we had one of those computers you, you had to answer lots of questions on for careers as well. It wasn't a BBC micro, but one of my friends did it and it told him he should be a French polisher. 
And we didn't even know what that was at the time, but there we go. Adam Glynn, BBC Three Counties Radio. Adam, thank you very much indeed. BBC Three Counties Radio, first for news. Gail, did they, that couple name their child after their car? They did, Vauxhall Sphera. Oh, how common. <laughs> It, no, it is. I know you can't comment. You're going to sit on the fence, and good for you. But it, oh, it's very common, isn't it? Well, I don't know. My husband's a car nut, so he thought about Porsche or Mercedes. Oh, I vetoed those. Well done, you. Yeah. No class at all, Gail. No class at all. How common. Right, morning, Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties. Lots to cram in, so I'll get on with it, shall I? How much do you reckon the top boss of your council earns? Well, the chief exec of Bucks earns more than the Prime Minister. I'll be speaking to the Taxpayers' Alliance to find out how his salary compares to others. And we'll have more on the men in sheds as well. 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. The Chief Executive of Buckinghamshire County Council receives £207,000 a year. How does that make you feel? Well, that's according to the annual Taxpayers Alliance Rich List published today. Uh, That was also the case in Hertfordshire until recently when a new Chief Executive was appointed on an annual pay of £170,000. We'll speak to Hearts County Councillor Derek Ashley in a minute. But first, Jonathan Isabey is from the Taxpayers Alliance. Good morning, Jonathan. Good morning, Ian. Well, £207,000 for the Bucks County Council Chief Exec. How does that sit in with the rest of the country? Well, once you add in the fact that he gets pension contributions of nearly £50,000 on top of the salary, uh, his total remuneration is £259,000 a year, which actually makes him the fifth best remunerated council employee in the country, which is quite something. Are they worth the salary? I mean, I think it's for individual people in their own areas to decide whether they think they're worth it, depending on how the the, the performance they're getting from their local councils. The reason that we publish this information, we we go through the accounts of councils up and down the country to put all in one place the so-called town hall rich list, and it's available to inspect on our website at www.taxpayersalliance.com, and people can judge for themselves and compare and contrast the, the amount of money that their councils are giving to the highest paid executives. Uh, as compared with their neighbouring councils. Are there any signs of wage restraint among councils? Well, nationally, we've seen the number of people getting more than £100,000 in total remuneration reduced by about 11% uh, over the year that this study uh, considers, which is obviously good news. Uh, it's still more than 2,500 people getting that kind of remuneration. But that's, that's not to say there aren't places where we've seen uh, the reverse happening. And, and you know, both Buckinghamshire and Luton have actually seen an increase in the number of people taking total remuneration of more than £100,000, which we think is probably the wrong direction, given that councils at the moment are struggling to deal with very tight budgets and having to find savings. What about the argument, uh, Jonathan, that if these people worked in the private sector, they could be earning possibly twice as much as they get now? Well, the public sector is not the private sector. The public sector is based on paying tax- taxpayers' money in those salaries. Uh, the, the, the average pay in the public sector uh, generally is, is, is and, and certainly the perks and pensions are, are far better than you get in a lot of private sector jobs. And, of course, in the public sector, it's not like running a business. You know, if you run a business, you've got to make a profit and sell your product or your service, and if you don't, you go bankrupt. Whereas at a council, you have a guaranteed income stream every year through council tax, regardless of how well you perform. Jonathan, it's me from the Taxpayers' Alliance. Thank you very much uh, indeed. 08459 455 555. What do you think? £207,000 a year, the Chief Exec of Bucks County Council. Well, we sent our uh, reporter Justin Dealey out into Buckingham this morning. Justin, what have uh, people been saying to you? It's an incredible figure, isn't it? Two hundred and seven thousand pounds. It's, it's almost half of w- what you get, isn't it? So, I mean, <laughs> how does say, he live on that? It's not far off your wage. <laughs> um, I was in Hertfordshire earlier. One hundred and seventy thousand pounds there for their chief exec. People furious about that. I've been in Buckingham this morning. I've been getting reactions to the fact that Chris Williams, the chief exec, is on that figure of two hundred and seven thousand pounds a year. Some very interesting views. This is what happened. So Andrew, you've lived in Buckinghamshire for 30 years or so. How much do you think the chief exec of Bucks County Council is getting paid every year? Uh, 150,000. The correct answer is 207,000 pounds. As somebody who's ultimately paying towards that, can you give us your reaction, please? 
absolutely shocked and disgusted because in a recession we cannot afford to pay that kind of wage to people. Everybody out there is struggling. I see people every day of the week that are living hand to mouth and can't afford to feed the children, can't afford to feed their animals, and and yet we're paying this kind of wage to somebody to work on our behalf. It's wrong. Well, sir, you're originally from Glasgow, but you yeah. lived here in Buckinghamshire for 20 years now. How much do you think the chief exec of Bucks County Council is getting paid every single year? I don't know. Take a wild guess. A wild guess about between 45 and 60,000 a year. Keep going. What, higher? Yep. 100,000. Keep going. 150,000. 207,000 pounds. Christ! How do you feel about that? Sick. I, I mean, that's just wrong. When, when, when people are suffering um, in extreme poverty, people are living from, from hand to mouth and everything else, you know, and, and, and he's earning that, that amount of money. It's just obscene. And finally, madam, you lived in Buckinghamshire for 53 years. How much do you think the chief exec of Buckinghamshire County Council is getting paid every year? Take a guess for me. 70 grand a year. 70 grand. Mm. 207,000 pounds. Can we get your initial reaction to that? I think it's disgusting. The way the country is at the moment, it's really bad. People not very happy, Justin. <laughs> Absolutely not. I mean, in Hertfordshire, that they were fuming at £170,000. Then we go to Buckinghamshire, it's £207,000. You can say what you want about how much money Chris Williams is, is saving the county council. You can bring into the argument about the private sector. But so many people right now, as you've heard there, they're really, really struggling. And when they hear that figure of over £200,000, it just makes them absolutely furious. You've heard the views there people not happy at all. Justin, thank you very much indeed. We can talk now to Conservative Councillor Derek Ashley, who's Hertfordshire County Council's Cabinet Member for Resources. And just to remind you, the uh, uh, Chief Executive in Hertfordshire County Council uh, earns £170,000 a year. Good morning, Derek. Good morning. Why was the Chief Executive sal- salary allowed to top the £200,000 mark in the first place when Caroline Tapster held the post? Well, I think uh, during the, uh, the years of the Labour government, it did get rather overheated in local government, and I think everybody recognises that. And, well, it's, it's um, still rather overheated now under the, the coalition. Well, I think we're, we're, we believe we're paying something uh, at a competitive level, um, and uh, we believe when compared with the size of our organisation with all the um, other areas of local government, we believe the salary is, um, is at about the right level. We don't believe it's excessive. But, of course, Hertfordshire has services, um, is delivering services for a million people. We employ thousands of staff, and uh, we believe we have to pay a salary that is reasonable and competitive to actually manage that organisation. There will be people listening, Derek, who would suggest that £170,000 is still too excessive when all of the cuts and all of the the things that are happening in these times of austerity. How would you defend that that salary? Well, I think everybody has a view on top salaries, and um, I think one of the advantages of local government, uh, compared with other parts of the public sector, uh, it's all very transparent. Um, There are many areas of the public sector where I think it is far less transparent, and I think a lot of people don't uh, know actually what's going on in the public sector is transparent and I believe it's right that we, uh, we're here to, um, to defend it. Ten other staff in Hearts County Council earning more than £100,000 a year. Is, are they necessary? Uh, we believe that, that they are and we believe it's competitive but if you look at, the, if you look at our comparati- uh, comparison with other authorities of a similar size uh, we are fairly low down the chart quite frankly and um, we've held that, uh, that level for a number of years. It's certainly not increasing. And what do the people who earn over £100,000 a year do? Um, they are ta- uh, taken responsibly for major areas of, um, of delivery, whether it is uh, adult care services, all the services delivered to uh, the elderly people, whether it's highways and transport, those kind of services. What about the, um, the people who are responsible for children's education and are on, I don't know, 18, 20, £22,000 a year? H- how do you think they feel when they hear about these big salaries? Well, I think uh, it's a very good point. Um, the vast majority of people who work in local government are on fairly modest salaries and do an excellent job. But you have to remember that uh, a a county like Hertfordshire employs tens of thousands of people and, of course, um, uh, you know, people who are looking after and managing those people have a very big responsibility. Now, in terms of the total number of people we employ, the numbers who are 
uh, on those kind of salaries is very, very low, and they carry a lot of responsibility. But then uh, you seem to have ignored the point that so do the teachers, you know, in, in terms of, of the responsibilities they have for children's futures, and, no, and they're earning a, a that, pittance in comparison. I've no doubt if you went around the, the, um, uh, the streets of Hertfordshire and um, asked people if they thought head teachers are worth ninety and £100,000 a year, they'd probably say um, no. But you have to accept some of these jobs are, be, carry a very heavy, heavy level of responsibility. Um, there, there are um, professional managers who are there to run the organisation professionally, and uh, we, have to, we have to look at the market and we have to pay what, what we believe is reasonable. With everyone tightening their belt, Derek, do you see further salary reductions happening uh, to the Chief Exec and, and other well-paid people in Hearts County Council? Well, I think, uh, I think overall in the public sector, and particularly in Hertfordshire, um, we have actually uh, drawn back quite substantially. As I said to you before, I think the whole market got very overheated in the last ten years, and I think uh, we in particular recognise that and we've drawn back and are now actually bearing down on some of these salary levels. So will, will John Wood still continue to earn £170,000 or will his salary go down? Well, I think uh, John Wood is on, on an a, agreed salary level. Quite clearly there's inflation to be taken into account over the years and we will review that appropriately. And, and what's his pension package? Well, the pension, the pension package uh, is related to, as you know, all local government employees are on a final... Uh, salary pension and of course the pension package is related to that and one of the big issues in local government as everyone is aware and indeed across the whole of the public sector whether it's local government central government uh, health service and probably even the BBC um, is the cost of pensions and that's a real issue for the future. One final question Derek, there will be people listening to this who, who uh, are low paid workers who are struggling to make ends meet or are having to go to food banks who are uh, uh, having to maybe use their car every other day because they can't afford fuel. How do you think they're feeling when they hear the chief exec is earning £170,000 a year? Well, I can understand, certainly, there are um, pr- strains and pressures um, across the economy as a whole. But as I say, Not affecting to... John Wood, are they? No, indeed. But, of course, we haven't got hundreds of people earning £170,000 a year. We have to pay a competitive salary for, that, for the person who is heading up an organisation uh, employing um, tens of thousands of people. And I think that applies in the public sector and the private sector. What we have to do is to make sure that salary is not excessive and we believe we've pitched it about right. And, and finally, you think £170,000 isn't excessive? Uh, for the job that's being undertaken and compared with other authorities of a similar size, and we are one of the largest authorities in the country, I believe it's, it's about the right level. But we do keep this under constant review and we understand the feelings out there in the community. Derek Ashley from uh, Hertfordshire County Council, the Conservative Councillor. Thank you very much indeed. What do you think? 08459 455 555. Bucks County Council declined to put anyone up for an interview this morning. They sent us a statement uh, basically saying that uh, Chris Williams has been Chief Exec for 13 years uh, and over the last 10 years has made savings or been responsible for savings of £180 million for taxpayers. Mike Naylor, Saturdays. From yeah, that sounds good. The Mike Naylor, Saturdays. It sounds really good. I'm, I'm, no, I'm looking forward to listen to that it's going to be a cracking show I'm not being rude no no <laughs> my name is what Ian what no <laughs> no it's going to be I'm, I'm, I'm saying more about Mike Naylor than that trailer it's going to be a cracking show what time is it on I don't know <laughs> It's on Saturday. I'll be listening to Three Counties all Saturday. Two o'clock. Anyway. So, thank you. Two o'clock. I'm going to dedicate the next hour just to promoting Mike Naylor. Well, I'm promoting it, Mike Naylor. He's brilliant. The show's going to be on at two o'clock. I'll be listening. I listen all day <sighs> to the other stuff that's on on Saturdays. I don't know what it's on, but I listen to it. <laughs> just, and I, just because we're only working together for no. two more days does not mean you can start taking advantage. Of who? You. Oh, OK. Well, well, that's a shame. <laughs> no. Situation. Well, listen, Mike, he's getting more mentions than otherwise. Mike Naylor, two o'clock, Saturday. It's going to be a really good <laughs> listen. I'm going to listen to it on two radios. Who's that, Mike Naylor? Who? Who? Why the did re- you stop him, anyway? Because I stopped it because Jonathan Vernon-Smith is going to give me a rollicking. He was having a go at me. Well, I, was, I wouldn't quite call it a rollicking. I think you're over-dramatising you it. St- you were stirring it up. And well, you were telling I me off. Well, I clearly said that I, uh, in my opinion, both you and Gail on news today yes. are mispronouncing Codicott. You Codicott. keep saying Codicott. Codicott. It's not Codicott. I used to live there. It's Codicott. Codicott. It's, well, now, hang on. Don't you join in. Yeah, well, I've had enough of you now. My new producer won't be like that, will she? It's it's Codicott, not Codicott. OK, it's co- it's it doesn't... Does it really... It's Codicott. I'm going to throw something else into the mix. There's a Coldicott in Milton Keynes. Coldicott, you see. Yeah, you get very Coldicott. confused if you say Codicott because people think you mean Coldicott. OK, so how do I pronounce it, Jonathan? Codicott. 
OK. And can you, can you now apologise to Mike Naylor? Well, why have I got to apologise to Mike Naylor? Because his trail will stop. He's on Saturdays from two. His trail will stop because of you. you. Because of me. Coming in, big, Billy Coggy Big got. Boots coming in. Oi, oi, Lee, you've been saying it wrong all morning, Lee. <laughs> That's his real voice, by the way, dear listener. That's how he actually speaks. All right, Lee, you... you uh, Ooh. Look, Mike's there. Mike. <laughs> yeah, we're getting told Mike off by... Naylor, no, though. that's not Mike Naylor. No, that's Mike who does the trails. Oh, there's too many Mikes. It spoiled the broth. I Mike has come down to... suddenly become very unpleasant, and it was all my your fault. fault. Yes, I'm glad you're accepting responsibility for it. Apologies to Mike the trail guy. Apologies to Mike Naylor for... He, he shows on at two o'clock on Saturdays, and boy, am I going to be listening to... I'm busy. Really? I'm out then. And to me. One to I'm not apologising to you. <laughs> One to me. No, I'm not apologising to you. Oh, what's Have going you finished on? in there, producer Laura? Just. You have now, yes. Jonathan, nice to see you, mate. What's on your show this morning? London Coney. London Colney. How do you say it? I used to live, I can reveal this now because I don't live there anymore, mm. I used to live on Colney Hatch Lane. There's an L in it. You pronounce the L. Colney Hatch Lane. Right. So that uh, well-known train station in London and part of London, Holborn. Do you pronounce it Holborn? OK, how do you pronounce um, M-A-R-Y-L-E-B-O-N-E? Because you're going to get it wrong. Well, say it again. I need to write M-A-R-Y it down. M-A-R-Y... M-A-R-Y... L-E-B-O-N-E. Marleybone. Oh, you do... Yeah, OK, you got that one right. Because some people... <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll, I'll give it that. It got, Mar- it's Marleybone. It's Marleybone, of course yeah, it is. Some people say Marylebone. It's London Coney. Colney. No, it's not London Colney. London a... Coney, it's Codicott, Marleybone and Hoban. You're going to get such a slap. Oh, physical violence. On the big phone in this morning at nine today, do you think we should have a referendum on Europe now? David Cameron is facing further calls to hold an early referendum on whether Britain stays in the European Union. The Mid-Beds MP Nadine Dorries is among Conservative Eurosceptics pressing for a decision in this Parliament. The Prime Minister is already promising a public vote after the next election in 2015, should they retain power. Well, now the former Chancellor, Norman Lamont, has added his weight to the debate, saying the UK could easily survive on its own outside of the EU. Well, from nine this morning, I want to hear your views. This, this whole idea of a European referendum certainly seems to be uh, ramped up more and more. Well, do you think we should have a referendum now on Europe? Do you think now is the time? 08459 455 555. I want your view on the big phone in this morning from nine. Do I keep talking till you finish that lump of chocolate? I do. What, what, what flavour is it? Chocolate flavour. <laughs> Cho- chocolate flavour. <laughs> chocolate. We've got, got posh chocks in there. You can go and have a look if you want. Don't touch, but have a look. Sam classy. They were half price. <laughs> they were. They were. were they? Yeah. they were. Oh, that's nice. Well, um, I guess we finished here, have we? Well, I think so. It's been quite a morning. Off you go. Bye bye. <clears throat> Just get my bits together. Don't forget your phone. After Cody Cot, Marylebone, Holborn, London Colney. What a plum. Call 08459 455 555. 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. Now, when you or your partner was pregnant, you might have worried about making it to the hospital. I know we did. We were terrified we wouldn't get there. Well, one expectant mum from Hertfordshire ended up giving birth in the back of the family car earlier this week. Imagine clearing that out. Imagine going up to your Tesco's. You know at the side of Tesco's or Sainsbury's, they always have some lads who are doing car valeting, right? 15 quid or whatever. Imagine turning up, how much to do this? 15 quid. Oh, there's blood everywhere. There's placenta on the back. Well, Corinne Stokes from Royston has given her baby girl the middle name Zafira, Zafira after her Vauxhall people carrier. Corinne, at what point in the journey did you realise you were going to give birth in your car? Um, pretty much five minutes after leaving home. How far away was the hospital? Uh, about ten miles. <laughs> Whoa! And was it your, your partner that was driving? Yeah, he was driving. And, and, and what did you say to him, Corinne? How did it, how did it pan out? Um, well, we just left, and I said, oh, I think I'm a bit further gone than we thought. I'd only had contractions for about 45 minutes. Oh, lucky you, yes. So, yeah, a lot quicker, and he j- was just trying to get to the hospital as quick as he could, obviously, and he just said, oh, well, just do what you've got to do. Mm-hmm. And then 
within minutes, I was pushing and she came straight out, so... Is it your first? It must be your second child. It's my third. Your third. Okay, right. That would explain. Yes, that would explain the, the, <laughs> the pushing and it coming straight out. And and what happened? Did you tell him to pull over? Was he driving when it happened? Did you go and sit in the boot? How did this work? Um, no. Well, the papers got it slightly wrong because it was actually in the passenger seat. So okay. I was next to my husband. Right. Okay. Oh, that's nice. Um, but I don't think he realised the baby was born. I kind of held her up in front of him and he freaked a little bit. <laughs> While he was driving along? Yeah, he hadn't realised. He was concentrating on the road. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's brilliant! So he's driving along and he's keeping an eye on the traffic. He's going maybe a little bit faster than he's meant to because we've all done that as expectant dads. Yeah. And then you went... Uh, uh, what's, your, what's your partner's name? Paul. Paul. You went, Paul. Paul, no, I can't focus now, Corinne. I can't, I'm driving. No, Paul, look, <laughs> it, she's here. And, and you just waved her in front of his face. Well, not right in front of no, his face, but be. yeah, I held her up. <laughs> and what did he do? Did he did he pull over? Did he carry on driving? No, he carried on driving. I think he was a bit worried. He wanted us to get to hospital, really, so... Listen, producer Laura, she's leaving next week to have her first baby. It, it won't be anywhere near as easy as this for your first producer, oh Laura. Oh, my God, I'm really stressed out. <laughs> Corinne, how on earth did you do this? He, your, your child would have still been attached and everything. Yeah, yeah, she was. <laughs> Yeah, she stayed like that till we got to the hospital. The midwife came out and took us up to the delivery suite. So. Did, did Paul at any point go, oh, look what you've done to the seat of my car? No, he was very good, but I heard it was a bit of a mess. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, have you taken it in to be cleaned yet? Have the, what have the, the lads at the valeting service said? No, well, actually, it's all clean. It's come up fine. You would never guess now. Um, but my dad and Paul did it on the, <laughs> the Sunday morning. For Luckily, those... my mum's got a good cleaning kit with steam sterilisers well, I was and say, Karen, cleaners and things. For so. those, those people listening, this could be a top tip. How do you get rid of placenta from a car seat? <laughs> I don't know. I didn't you, ask. You didn't ask. You didn't ask. Now, <laughs> listen. Listen, Corin. What's, what's your, the daughter's, your daughter's full name? Um, it's Lila May Zafira Stokes. Lila, I love it. Gorgeous. I used to know a girl called Lila. I think it's a wonderfully underused name. May, fantastic, full of the joys. Is that her? That's her, Oh, yeah. gosh. <laughs> May is full of the joys of spring. It's gorgeous. Stokes, wonderful. Zafira, I, I, let me put this to you. Is it not a bit common to name her after a car? No. <laughs> Is it not? Well, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't my choice. It was my husband. Oh, so. did you? Well, <laughs> did you not say, "Oh, come on, Paul"? It's a, <laughs> it's the name of a car. We might as well just call her Vauxhall. Well, the only thing I did say is that I was really glad we got rond- rid of the Mondeo because we'd only had this car a few months. <laughs> if it was in the Mondeo, I wouldn't have allowed it. <laughs> and uh, I can, we can hear her squeaking away there. How, how old is she now? When did you have her? Sunday. She's five days. Oh, she's still brand new then. Yeah, she is. Oh, fantastic. And is she, is she healthy and everyone's well and everything's yeah, fine? everybody's well, yeah. And uh, the other kids, how old are the other kids? Um, n- my little boy's nearly four and my little girl's two. And uh, they must be loving having a younger sister. They are, yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, listen, I th- I, I'm, I'm not sure about the name, Zafira, but it's your choice. But <laughs> congratulations. I'm glad everything's healthy and well. Oh, f- what a fantastic story as well to tell her when she gets older. Oh, thank you. Corin, best of luck. Enjoy it. Five. You forget five days. They are so tiny. I'm, I'm still not convinced about the name, Zafira. But the other's wonderful. And congratulations to everybody involved there. <laughs> Oh, that was the wrong one! Across beds, hearts and bucks, this That's better. is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio. I've got my three-year-old boy, when, when something goes wrong, I've got my three-year-old boy saying, don't panic, Mr Mannering, don't panic, Mr Mannering. He has no idea what it means, and neither do most of the kids working here. Morning, this is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. You may remember last October, we told you about an initiative in Milton Keynes called Men in Sheds. It offers the chance for men to do woodwork, model-making and crafts surrounded by other people rather than on their own. Well, this uh, scheme has proved so popular, it's expanding. We've sent Justin Dealey there to find out what's going on. And it's Musical Friday. All this morning, we've been talking about young people who have aspirations to work in the music or TV industry. I'll be meeting 17-year-old Maisie Berry from Hertfordshire, who dreams one day of becoming a professional singer. She reached the boot camp stage of The X Factor. 08459 455 555 if you want to get in touch. Now, back to this story about the project in Milton Keynes, which aims to prevent more elderly men from becoming lonely. Men in Sheds offers men the chance to do woodwork, model-making and craft surrounded by other people rather than on their own. Well, it's been such a huge success that the group have now been asked to work with men from Aylesbury, Buckingham, Bedford and Hemel Hempstead in setting up their own sheds. And they're looking to extend their opening hours to meet the demand. Our reporter Justin Dealey is down at the Kiln Farm Industrial Estate in Milton Keynes ahead of their open day later on today. Justin. Ian, it's all happening down here um, with the men. 
We're outside the shed. Hey. Gents, give us a quick cheer. Come on. Oh, <laughs> testosterone. Live across bed and box. It's a fantastic scheme, this, in. I came here, what, last October? Um, since then, things have really moved on. Lots of people here by the radio car, by the shed. One of those is Gary Noakes. Gary, you're the chairman of Men in Sheds at Milton Keynes. How many men come to this shed, then? About 40. About 40 or so. And what do they do inside this shed? They do wood, carpentry, metalwork, modelling, anything they like. I mean, so much talent here. Well, why do you think that you've been so successful w- with this initiative in Mills and Keynes? Just word of mouth, really. It's such a good idea that it's just growing all the time. So how did you find out about it? For a friend. Just a friend that worked here, or rather came here. I mean, there, there's so much that goes on inside this shed. People really need to, to see it to believe it. We'll talk about the open day in just a second. But if you want to be a member here, you can come down to this shed, do what you want uh, within reason. How much does that cost? £3 a week. Um, tea and coffee free. <laughs> <laughs> Sold. <laughs> uh, yeah, you can do what you want. Uh, they've got one guy building an uh, electric car. as someone building a, a real plane. <laughs> Um, model railway, uh, model planes that fly, all types of woodwork. And the banter must be great amongst you lads. It must be brilliant down here. Oh, that's the best part. I think yeah. we're all come because uh, Not for we're all. Yeah, it's like a, <laughs> like a happy family most yeah. of the time. <laughs> okay, so it's the open day today. It's between ten thirty and three thirty. Uh, we're here at the shed in Milton Keynes. Um, just remind people where this shed is, and if they want to pop down, they can do, of course. Yes, it's Unit 30, Berners Lane, Kiln Farm. Uh, phone number, if you get lost, is Milton Keynes, 267 126. Brilliant stuff. Uh, Steve, tell us what you're making here, please. Um, well, what I'm making is an electric car, which started out as a drunken bet I had with somebody. <laughs> uh, too many beers, and I said I could build an electric car for £750. That was four years ago. Um, it, the project took a pace because uh, I started l- doing some part-time lecturing at the University of Bedfordshire in Luton, and I mentioned this plan for this car to a couple of the professors, and they said, sounds great, do you want to do a PhD on it? Which, uh, once I picked myself up from the floor with the shock, I thought, well, yeah, why not? You know, I'm not doing anything else at the moment, uh, and you're never too old to... Uh, uh, just to learn something else. So um, I said, yeah, OK. You and your drunken bets, I see. Well, best of luck for that. And let's have a final word here with Paul Griffiths. Come over here for us, Paul. You're from Age UK in Milton Keynes. Can you tell us how Age UK are involved in this project? Well, we rent the unit for a Milton Keynes Community Foundation and we thought that the Men in Sheds project would be a great project to put into the building. Uh, we run quite a lot of projects, but what we find is that the vast majority of people attending are women. There's nothing really for men. And I think men miss that camaraderie that they perhaps had when they were in work. And in retirement, they become mainly, some of them can become quite isolated. They're not as gregarious, not as socially minded as women. But the shed now provides them with an opportunity to get together and do the things that they perhaps are doing on their own in a shed at the bottom of the garden. Do that in a more social setting. And people may say, come on, men in sheds, what on earth is this all about? But, but clearly, so many people get so much from this. And you must be delighted that this has been so successful here that you're now helping neighbouring towns with their own projects. I mean, it's an incredible success story, this, isn't it? It is. I mean, we're very pleased. I mean, I have to say the credit goes to the shedders themselves. They're the people that put in all the hard work. Uh, AGK Milton Keynes just facilitated. But yes, we're, we're now talking to people in Aylesbury, in Buckingham, in Bedford. We had a guy over from Hemel Hempstead, and only yesterday I had someone on the phone saying they're coming to the opening with a group of men from Winslow mm. because they want to open something similar there. Brilliant stuff. I would say that uh, Ian Lee could pop down, but but what you're looking for really is is real men. I mean, oh, not, for not goodness sake, Steve. Oh, we're looking for real men. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Ian, you're not welcome today. Yeah, but because <laughs> a, a real man is a bloke who has his shirt at half-mast <laughs> and wears a snood. <laughs> yes, that's me, that's me. But you know what, Ian, I have to say, when I came here before, um, the atmosphere was fantastic. It's, it's really come on since then. Um, so many men get so much from this. You know, they could be in their sheds doing things by themselves. They come here, they're learning new skills... The banter's absolutely fantastic. The open day today is between 10.30 and 3.30, so if you want to pop along, you can do so and see exactly how it works. Justin, Mm. what's your middle name? Luke. Is it? Yes. 
Where's this going? Uh, no, I'm just, I'm just curious. <laughs> we just, we've had a, a lady who gave birth in her car while yeah. her, her fellow was driving along, and they've given the middle name Zafira after Ooh, the Vauxhall yeah, Zafira that, that yeah. she was was born in. And I just was wondering if uh, you had an exciting middle name. You don't. It's no. one of the dullest I've ever heard. <laughs> but Com- in saying that, uh, th- there was somebody I went to school with, yeah. and their sister was born in a Jaguar. I think on the side of the A41 many years ago. So the middle name for that girl is Jaguar. Oh. So a lot of people out there do have middle names or even first names associated with the car if, of course, they were born in the car. I, d- I really do think that, that naming your child in relation to a car, I do think it's very common. <laughs> but in saying that, of course, I'm sure a lot of people would name their children after pop stars. Um, maybe in the future, Ian, you know, with your monkey's obsession, and yep. let's be brutally honest, it yep. is a rather very sad obsession, mm. um, you may have something to do with the monkeys naming future children. My, 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 if I have a daughter, she's going to be called Dolenz. Yeah. Oh, without <laughs> exactly, a shadow of a doubt. Exactly, exactly. Justin, thank you very much indeed. Stuart's in Milton Keynes. Good morning, Stuart. Morning, Ian. You've called in about child's, children's names. Yes. Go on, what have you got? Well, my daughter's called Tanya Portia. Why? Why? Well, it's better than Tanya Corsa or Tanya Micra, and the whole family's into our cars. Yeah. So why not? Do you not think, Stuart, my tongue is slightly in my, my cheek, as I'm sure you're aware, but do you not think, though, it's a little bit common? Naming, no. your, naming, your, naming your beautiful daughter, your pride and joy, daddy's little girl, more, after a more, car? No, 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 no. More people name their children where they're conceived. And I didn't want oh. Tanya Taxi, you know, so <laughs> it's a better choice. <laughs> Oh, Stuart, you've got a horrible image in my mind now. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. There's a whole we could, we could have a whole where were you conceived phone in. I think we'll save that for a, for a very quiet bank holiday. <laughs> oh eight four five nine four double five five double five is the telephone number. But the, the, more people named after cars. I'm surprised that so many of the listeners, that so many of you, have named your children after cars. Why have you done that? Let's be honest. You know it. It's common isn't it? it? It is. It is common. Oh, eight four five nine four double five five double five. I haven't got a middle name. My middle name was Lee. Lee isn't my last real name. It is now. I've changed it for legal reasons. It didn't used to be. It used to be rugby. <laughs> spell that. You can't. You can't spell it. That's why I changed it. Oh, eight four five nine four double five five double five is the telephone number. We've been talking about the fact that it's, uh, it's been revealed that the uh, chief exec of Bucks County Council earns £207,000 a year. <clears throat> That's excluding pension contributions, which brings the total to about £256,000 a year, something like that. What do you think about that? Is that money well spent? Well, um, Stephen in MK has emailed in. Traditionally, public sector stroke council workers were lowly paid. Of course, that is clearly not the case now, but they still get their golden pensions, which cost the public a lot of money to fund. If Buck's council chief exec was leaving now, After a career at the council, he could be leaving on a pension of over £100,000 a year. To fund a pension like that, an ordinary person would need a pension pot of about £2.5 million. If £200 million has been saved by this chief exec, why hasn't their council tax plummeted? To justify Chris Williams, who is the uh, chief exec of Bucks County Council, to justify his £207,000 salary, compared his job to running a FTSE 100 company. Unlike a FTSE 100 company, the council are guaranteed to get their income rolling in. So not sure how there can be a comparison to the role of a CE of a huge commercial company. A difficult job, I'm sure, but unlike the CE of the bankrupt Woolworths, for instance, the council will always carry on with their guaranteed cash flow. What do you think? Got 15 minutes left of the show. We've yet to have a, a, a listener get in touch this morning and say, actually, £207,000, I think it's fair enough. It's a tough job. He's saved £180 million over the last ten years. Yeah, pay, pay him that much money. Why not? We had an expert saying that. We had uh, someone working for Hearts County Council who justified their chief exec's £170,000 a year salary. But do you think £207,000 a year for what is, let's be honest, it's got to be a tough job, hasn't it? It's not an easy job at all, I wouldn't have thought. Do you think that that £207,000 is justified? Aren't we all a little bit jealous of Chris Williams and his two hundred and seven grand? Really, aren't we? We are. You are. You are. You're jealous because you chose a job that pays you, what, I don't know, 15 grand, 25 grand a year, 30 grand a year? 
And you're thinking, oh, if only, if only I'd gone into the public sector, if only I were as clever and as talented as this Chris Williams obviously is. You are thinking that, aren't you? This um, anger and resentment at his £207,000 a year salary, it's jealousy. You're jealous, aren't you? 08459 four double five five double five. Oh, look, there we go. Hang on a second. Look, I messed all this up. We can do this. Adam, bear with me. Bear with me. It's I'm, all right. No, all right. no, no. It's not all right. You deserve better than this rubbish, for goodness sakes. Hang on a second. Right. We're going to do that. Uh, right. I'm going to... This now. Hang on. Move this over here. Here, here and right now. Hit, yes. No one noticed. We'll cut that out, Adam. Don't worry. Here he is with the travel, Adam Glynn. Let's get the weather. Here's Elizabeth Rosini. That's the forecast. Sorry, I was miles away there, Elizabeth. What, was it good? Well, it's all right. It's just not good compared to last week. Were you not listening? No, I wasn't. I was. I was in oh, a little dream yeah. world. All right, I... bright and breezy today. Oh, don't do Tomorrow, it all again. Cool and showery thunderstorms. Oh, so you on Sunday? So Thank you can you. do it in twenty seconds. Why don't you do that every day? Save us all a little bit of you know, what? Um, nothing. Have a nice Fine. weekend. Bye. Oh, dear. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Don't forget, by the way, if uh, you have a story that you think we should be covering on this show, you can always send me an email. Also, if you think, you, you, you know, it, it could be a big news story that's happening in your entire county. It could be a tiny thing that's happening in your bedroom. If you think it's worthy of being on BBC Three Counties Radio, do send me an email. Ian.ly, I-A-I-N dot L-E-E at bbc.co.uk. And we might put you on the radio. We might not, let's be honest. If we think it's got merit, then we'll definitely put you on the radio. Now, what job did you want to do when you were younger. Uh, and what advice did your career advisor give you? I was told I should be a prison warden. What? Well, nowadays, lots of young people just want to be celebrities. As Britain's Got Talent and The Voice both get underway, a dance teacher from Luton is spending her own time and money teaching wannabe dancers the truth about the industry. Well, we sent our reporter, Sophie Solaria, to join Ish during one of her lessons. <laughs> This is not just for anybody who just wants to have a little dance. This is about people who want to be real and professional and want to make it and be successful and not phased by the glitz and the glamour. I mean, we're not here to sort of be famous. We're here to dance. The fame comes and goes, but the dance the artistry stays. Tell me why you are giving free lessons to people. The reason why it's free is basically because um, I'm training professional dancers to go into the industry and I need them to realise that it's not easy. It, it's, it's a lot of hard work. It's, it's a tough ride. You've got to go beyond your means here. This is, this is the kind of industry that this is because it's so competitive. You have to have that extra to be successful in it. And those are the people who stay on the training course. Those are the people who can only survive on the training course. The rest will just fall out because they just don't have the same commitment, they don't have the same sort of willpower, the, the physical strength or the mental strength. Do people come to you wanting to be famous? Well I do see, and this is this is this is what's happened in the past. The trainees have been with me for a while and then been and done some shows and suddenly it gets to their head. It's like, oh, you know, I'm a star now, I'm amazing. And I am trying to think to myself, well, you're not actually amazing because there's always going to be somebody else who's better than you. And I've actually sat them down and just told them you know, you're not a professional and you're not actually even that good. They're sort of just mesmerised by the glitz and the glamour, but they, they don't obviously realise how much hard work goes into it. I mean, it's difficult. You've got to be training all the time. You know, we're having injuries all the time here and there, you know, and it's not easy. You need to go with confidence that you're a dancer. You're there to do a job. You're there to perform. You perform, and we, we hardly ever go to the VIP parties, do we? We sort of do our performances and we come out. You know, we just simply do our job and then we leave. Why don't we do it? Tell me why. Why do you think why we don't go to those places? We're professional dancers. They say just yeah. come, don't they? Yeah. Why don't you go to the, the VIP parties, ladies? Because I think it's good to, some, to sometimes to stay professional and actually, you know, you're there to do a job at the end of the day. I don't want to have fun and joke and have a drink with you guys at the moment because we're not at that stage at the moment you know where they where i can call them professional dancers they will be professional dancers hopefully one day but at the moment they're still learning so we need to keep focused so if we go start hanging out to parties we're losing focus we're losing track and we don't want to lose we don't want to lose our track do we we want to keep focus it sounds like a very very tough uh, da- dance teachers are are tough i'll let you into a little secret 
I've had a few dance lessons. Yes, I have. Don't laugh at that. I have. Can you not tell by my uh, athletic body and the way I'm in complete control of my gangly arms? Dance teachers are horrible. I mean, not, not the Ish. I'm sure Ish is delightful, but they're, they're, they can be really uh, tough. Uh, joined now by Maisie Berry. I'm trying to get myself out of that hole. Good morning, Maisie. <laughs> Hello. How are you? You're right. Yeah, I'm really good, thank you. You're 17 years old. 18. Excuse me, when was your birthday? <laughs> oh, my birthday was 15th of Feb. I actually come in to in here yeah. um on the 16th to do um oh, an interview that. i'm going to be 40 next month are oh, you yeah. You don't you, look here. You, well, that's nice, but first of all, you look disgusted then. You're like, oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my, I? 40. And I, I remember being being 18 and thinking 40 would never happen to me. This will happen to you. Yeah. This grey, everything was going to happen to you one day. Oh, I was thinking about that last night. I wonder what it's going to be like to be old. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> to be old? <laughs> not old, but it's, like, yeah, it's, like, it's, not 40, but like more like, I don't know, like my nan's age. It's horrible. Yeah, I'll tell you now, it, do, it doesn't get any better. It's yeah. all downhill from where you are. Now, you want to be a professional singer? I do. What, what kind of stuff? You've got a guitar there, so already you're showing a little bit more integrity than yeah. perhaps some of the people <laughs> we see on tape. What kind of stuff do you want to do? Well, I've got my, I've got my own kind of style, really. I've never... When I, I've, we've always, me and my mum and that, we sit there and think, what kind of like, genre would I like class my music as? Yeah. And I really don't really know. Like, I, I, I just... It's, Kind of, I don't know what to I call tell, it. I tell you what we we'll do. You you give us a song now. Mm. I'll I'll classify <clears throat> it for you. How about that? Okay. Then. Yeah, what, what are you going to play for us? Um, it is called Love Is Raw. Away you go. <laughs> oh, that was fantastic for so many reasons. A because it was brilliant. <laughs> we'll get Thank your details you. in a bit, a bit of where people can find you. And also, you finished bang on time. Perfect. Stay there. You're such a handyman with that mic. <laughs> I, I was doing a little bit of work there. I'll explain more in a minute. Here's Adam. I say I'm mildly intrigued. Adam Glynn, BBC Three Counties Radio. Adam, thank you very much indeed. Well, that was Maisie Berry. You heard Maisie very quickly. How can people get in touch with you? Yeah, um, basically, I've got a Facebook. Give um, us that quickly, quickly. Maisie B um, and Maisie Berry. Uh, All right, listen, we've got to go have a lovely weekend. That was brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Right, Ta-ta. Thank you. Getting beds, hearts and bugs talking. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you, Ian and Maisie. <laughs> 